Thank you all for joining us today to celebrate Sunshine Week 2016 at the National Archives. For those of you who do not know me, I am the Director of the Office of Government Information Services, James Holzer, which serves as the Federal FOIA Ombudsman. The National Archives is the natural home for an event marking the Freedom of Information Act's 50th anniversary and honoring open government. As I am sure many of you know, the Archivist of the United States, David S. Ferriero, has long been a champion of transparency, participation, and collaboration. After a distinguished career leading the New York Public Library and two prestigious academic libraries, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Duke University, David was confirmed as the 10th Archivist of the United States on November 6, 2009. Please join me in welcoming the Archivist of the United States, David S. Ferriero, to the stage to present today's program. Thank you, James, and welcome all to my house. It's nice to have you here with us this afternoon, and happy Sunshine Week 2016. Sunshine Week marks the, the birth week of James Madison, our nation's father of the Constitution. Madison spoke eloquently about the power of knowledge, particularly for people who mean to be their own governors. It was not until 1954, however, that a bill was introduced in Congress that gave the public the right to, to the right of access to government information. Twelve years after the bill was first introduced, President Lyndon Johnson signed the Freedom of Information Act into law without a bill signing ceremony or any of the usual pomp and circumstance. This Sunshine Week marks the Freedom of Information Act's 50th anniversary, and I hope you all had a chance to stop by the display case outside the McGowan Theater on your way in this afternoon to wish FOIA a happy birthday in person. If you didn't see the document previously, you can view the document during our first break this afternoon. Let me tell you a little bit about what we do here at the National Archives. We exist to make access happen, and good records management is the backbone of open government. NARA works with other agencies to help them manage their records from the time the records are created until they are either properly disposed of or transferred to our ownership. Our staff work every day to provide access to the federal records that tell the story of our nation's shared history or the personal history sought by genealogists or veterans. On his first day in office, President Obama committed his administration to creating an unprecedented level of openness in government. And then at the National Archives, we've embraced this call to action and have taken the lead in developing new approaches to open government. And I'm proud of the, our role as an open government leader. The Open Government National Action Plan reflects this agency's significant and ongoing efforts to strengthen open government. The latest National Action Plan includes several initiatives to advance open government at the National Archives and, acro and across the government including management government records, modernizing the implementation of FOIA, streamlining the declassification process, implementing the Controlled Unclassified Information Program, developing a machine-readable government organization chart, and increasing the impact of open innovation activities. As part of our agency's open government plans, the National Archives has implemented more than 120 actions to improve transparency, participation, and collaboration since 2010. Through our plan's flagship initiative, Innovate to Make Access Happen, we've launched a new archives catalog, which furthers our citizen activist crowdsourcing efforts by inviting the public to add tags, comments, and transcriptions to the records of the federal government. This year, the National Archives is a co-chair of the Interagency Open Government Working Group which brings open government advocates from across the government together to share best practices and promote each other's work. These meetings are hosted at the National Archives and are open to our friends in civil society on a quarterly basis. From now until June, we will be developing our fourth open government plan, and we need your ideas and feedback on how we should bring even greater transparency, participation, and collaboration to the way in which we do our work. Please be on the lookout for blog and social media posts where you can post your ideas or you can op email opengov.nara.gov. 
Today's event was organized by the Office of Government Information Services. As the FOIA Ombudsman, OGIS is a natural home for the national, has a natural home here at the National Archives. OGIS is charged with providing mediation services to help resolve disputes between FOIA requesters and federal agencies. And since its creation in 2009, the office has provided assistance to requesters in all 50 states and in 22 foreign countries. Its staff have developed a training program to help agency FOIA professionals avoid and resolve disputes with requesters. 600 FOIA professionals from 58 departments and agencies took this training. OGIS has a robust FOIA compliance program that provides agencies with detailed and customized recommendations for how to improve the agency's FOIA program. The first two programs assessed by OGIS were components of the National Archives. They have also released three assessments of components of the Department of Homeland Security. Dr. James Holzer, the director of OGIS, chairs the Federal FOIA Advisory Committee, and members of his staff provide administrative support to the committee. The committee brings together experts from inside and outside government to discuss and develop consensus recommendations for how to improve FOIA. And I'm pleased to see several members of that group here with us today. I look forward to reviewing the committee's first recommendations in the coming months. And I feel confident that OGIS is in the best position yet to create change in the administration of FOIA and be a critical part of how the National Archives makes, happens, makes, makes access happen. Our speakers today will be talking to you more about recent litigation involving the Freedom of Information Act and how technology can be used to open government. Leveraging technology is a key component to the innovation efforts at the National Archives. And later on in the program, Pam Wright, NARA's Chief Innovation Officer, will tell you more about these efforts, including our crowdsourcing efforts with our Citizen Archivist dashboard, transcription in our online catalog, engagement with Wikipedia, as well as our new innovation hub, and our newest pilot, History Hub. Before we begin today's program, I want to remind you once more that the Freedom of Information Act itself is available for viewing outside the theater. Without any further ado, let me turn the program back to James. Thank you for being here. Thank you, David, for your remarks today. And thank you and NARA's leadership for your support uh, for this event and for OGIS. I'm so pleased to be with all of you today to celebrate Sunshine Week at the National Archives. As David so clearly outlined, open government is fundamental to the National Archives. And later in this program, you will hear more about how the National Archives is placing a premium on using technology to connect to the public, to our nation's records. People both inside and outside of government have an important role to play in showing how technology can be used to make the government more open, participatory, and collaborative, and in building the tools that make it happen. I ask that our first panelist join me on the stage while I give you all a brief introduction. The individuals on our first panel have worked from outside of government to create or contribute to projects that have made the government's information more accessible, usable, and meaningful. Michael Morrissey is the co-founder of Muckrock, a collaborative news site that helps the public file and track and keep track of requests for federal, state, and local government information. Lauren Ellen McCann works with the nonpartisan Public Policy Institute, New America, directing an initiative on civic life in Washington, DC. Her work focuses on community-led approaches to governance and social innovation, emphasizing creativity and collaborative online, uh, collaboration online and offline. Josh Taberer is a civic hacker and entrepreneur who launched GovTrack US in 2004. GovTrack helps the public track and understand the activities of the US Congress, and it was the first website to create open data for Congress. And of course, my predecessor, Miriam Nisbet, she will moderate this panel. Ms. Nisbet was one of the early supporters of an effort to build a multi-agency uh, FOIA portal and recently served as an instructor for a coaching program offered by GovLab at NYU designed to promote civic engagement and innovation.
Thank you, James. <clears throat> well, good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's wonderful to see you all, and uh, we're, we're uh, four people who are happy to sort of kick off the afternoon program uh, celebrating Sunshine Week. Um, James's introduction um, gave you a really nice snapshot, but only a snapshot, of the work um, that Michael and Lauren Allen and Josh have done. Um, uh, sort of, um, I, would, I would perhaps summarize the work that all three of you have done as uh, leading the way in helping people outside government to really be able to <laughs> sort of get inside, to participate, to be able to work with government um, using technology in, in ways that are really, um, really new in a 50-year-old Freedom of Information Act world. Um, I think it would be really helpful for people to hear a little bit about how you, how did you get here today? What led you to, to where you are today working on the things that you are working on now and have been working on? Because I'm sure you had many other choices in life, um, but openness and transparency is obviously what you chose. So um, maybe, Josh, would you start, and let's just take a few minutes um, for each of you to, to give us that sense of who you are. Sure, so, um, am I close enough? Uh, uh, so I, I started working on GovTrack about 15 years ago, and, uh, and since then I'm, I've been in a sort of con continual process of asking myself, why am I here? What, what actually am I doing? And, and I, I don't think I will ever know. Uh, so what, what uh, I first, <laughs> Uh, when I first got involved in this, I was, I was in college, it's a long time ago. Uh, I was taking a class on the intersection of copyright law and free speech, and, and we were learning about how policy was made, and we were told a little bit that, um, that a law that Congress had passed was, was not really very good. And I was thinking, well, boy, that, I'm a little bit mad. That, like, if only I had better information, if only America had better information about what Congress was doing, we could hold politicians accountable. Um, and then a couple of years later, I realized that was all wrong. So uh, when, you, when you go to vote, right, like the primary way the public holds people to account, uh, your options are like a Democrat and a Republican. And nothing that you read in the text of a bill before Congress is going to inform your choice about how to vote that day. Uh, so then uh, I thought, well, I really want access to like the data that Congress has. So I got invested in this data question for a while. I still am. Uh, and then there's, there's uh, I hate cynicism, so I want to I want to use information to to reduce cynicism, and I got I got caught up on that, but that was probably wrong too, uh, <laughs> and uh, so I, I I don't think uh, the reasons keep shifting for why for why I'm here, um, and I think every time I I learn more about how government governance works, I realize my previous uh, understanding of what I'm doing was probably wrong, and I shift, uh, and and so it, it keeps changing, but um, what what I realize is that. Uh, even though I, I, I keep finding that I'm wrong. Uh, and uh, however wrong I am, uh, my users on GovTrack are more wrong. They know even less than I do, right? And, and so actually, to some extent, I kind of do know what I'm doing, um, even though I don't really, I don't know sort of these details. But what I know is that I can, I can learn what I've been learning along this way. So every time I figure out that I'm wrong, I've learned something new about how government actually works. And I can take that and then tell my users, the American public, uh, or, or whatever, um, how government actually works, and then kind of bring them along the way as I'm learning things. Uh, so I think that's, that's kind of what motivates me now. It's kind of bringing people along the way as I learn how government actually works. Well, Josh, I think you're doing something right. <laughs> Thank you. Lauren Allen. Sure. Um, so like Josh, I feel like my process understanding what my role is anywhere, but especially in the open government or government reform space or open technology, basically pick a, a couple of words out of a hat, put them together, put the word open in front, and that's what my career is, <laughs> um, has been emergent and learning focused. Uh, I too was a copyright and free culture kid. Um, I had my revelation not looking at bill text, but actually trying to 
put on a reproduction of the 1950s radio play, The Shadow, which it turns out is owned by no less than four different family, corporate, government, uh, university, and other entities, and is an absolute intellectual property nightmare to navigate. And I was working at a community, uh, community radio station. During the day, I did reporting. In, during the evening, I did these radio play revivals. And my attempt at getting these radio transcripts was absolutely bananas. And it was the first time that, although I'd been taking a lot of different um, legal and different governmental practice studies during college, it, it was the first time that it really clicked to me how the way in which we own information impacts who has it who can use it, um, what it becomes in the future, right? So the shadow can go on in perpetuity to be a movie, but me and my random little technically fair use um, capacity as a random 20-year-old in the middle of Connecticut cannot touch it at all unless I want to get into some mega lawsuit that I definitely cannot afford. Uh, and from there, I thought that I was going to be a journalist, and this is how I was going to fight for the freedom of information and free culture, and it was going to be really great, and then I was a journalist, and it definitely was not what I was doing. I was reporting on internet, uh, not internet, interstate debates and like terrible public records, where did it go issues, and I just kept trying to advocate and like advocacy in the journalist space and realized that when I moved to DC, I actually had the opportunity to become an advocate. And so this led me to working at the Sunlight Foundation where I would go on to start Sunlight State and Local Team. I wrote our um, open data policy platform along with my colleagues and was really deep into the technology part for a while. And I thought, this is it, you know? like. We talk about transparency, we talk about engagement. Um, we're making it more accessible online for everyone. For everyone, for everyone, for everyone. But um, you know, look around the room, like who is everyone? What I continue to discover, the more I was doing my work, is that I was helping white, upper educated people, generally cis people, get access to information using the technology they already had access to. And that is a need. I think that like I don't want to start like splitting hairs in terms of who is and is not exactly privileged. But I, I do want to recognize that a lot of our efforts when we focus very linearly on technology does put other people at a disadvantage or it just ignores their experience because we're going to, we have creator bias. We're always going to be creating based on our own experience. And it was fascinating because I, um, given my experience, thought that technology was going to be this very simple, simple unifier. And as soon as I kind of had my own revelation space, I began to look at, okay, I bet you other people are making. I don't believe that like, humans are very crafty. Um, people who want government reform, people who want access to information are working on it. I bet they're just not using the same language I use. I bet they're just not in the same rooms I'm in. And so I, I began doing work as a community technology organizer. I began doing a lot of listening and learning. And this led me to working with the New America Foundation uh, as a civic innovation fellow with the Open Technology Institute, where I was learning from a lot of great community technologists there. And so the long story of why I'm in this room today is because I, I'm constant, and that's the question I'm chasing, is, is how do we build an intersectional open government movement? How do we look at technology um, beyond the boundaries of our own experience? And how do we begin to understand other government reform spaces when they don't speak the way we do and they practice uh, their craft differently? Because I would love to see a sunshine week that is like really powerfully celebrated around the country and maybe even involves a party. <laughs> um, I, I think a party sounds like a, a good idea after we've done the work. Um, Michael, how did you get here? Uh, yeah, so I flew JetBlue. Uh, <laughs> no, um, so I actually, I started out a little over six and a half years ago, uh, not interested in transparency, not actually interested in, in government operations, or definitely not government transparency. Uh, but sort of really concerned about the issue of local reporting was seeing fewer resources, that there was fewer people looking at and, and watching what, uh, what was going on in local t towns, state halls, and that sort of thing. Um, and so I, newspapers were kind of being gutted about that time and, and still are. So I wondered, with fewer reporters, with fewer people, with fewer traditional watchdogs, what could we do to sort of help fill the gap? And so my co-founder and I, we went back and we looked at sort of the traditional reporting that uh, in inspired positive change in communities. What was the sort of thing that led to reforms? What was the, what, what, what led to community engagement around an issue? And so we went back over decades and decades of reporting that inspired reform, inspired engagement, inspired better laws, inspired better democracy. 
And what we found was that time and time again, these stories had great reporting, they had great writing, but again and again, they had public records at the heart of that. Maybe that was a National Freedom Information Act request, maybe that was a local public records request, but again and again, so much of the reporting over the past decades was based on public records. Um, and so we spoke with dozens and dozens of newsrooms and we said, how often are you using public records? And again and again, the answer we heard was not much. We don't have time for that. Most newsrooms had the one person who used public records or the one FOIA guy or the one FOIA woman. And we found that this important law that led to so much of what we as an industry say is important just wasn't being used. So uh, we built this little site called Muckrock um, and said, what if we make it easy for people to file a public records request and then share that request with the world? Will pe more people use this law? Will we broaden the audience of who can engage with this? And so we tried that six years ago. Um, three months after we launched, the state of Massachusetts threatened to send me to jail, so I knew we were onto something good. Um, <laughs> And so ever since then, I've become more engaged with the open government community. We've seen that this isn't just a journalist thing, that, that FOIA isn't just a black box, but there's, there's other people trying to balance a lot of interests on the other side of that. And so over the past few years, we've continued to work with not just journalists, but we found that um, really broadening to civic groups, to the general public, to think tanks, to experts, um, and to a lot of people within government who are trying to help improve our democracy, who are trying to have a better informed um, public, better informed agencies, and really using public records in the Freedom Information Act in a broad array of ways, a broad array of, way, of ways um, to just make things work better, to let the public know what agencies are doing, and for agencies to better un have better informed decisions. Um, other than possibly facing jail in Massachusetts, um, what were some of the challenges, Michael, that, that you had along the way? Because with all of you, building something that hasn't been built before um, is, really, is really daunting. And I'm going to ask all of you the same question, but Michael, maybe you could lead off a little bit on, on the challenges. And maybe um, what surprised you in a good way? or a bad way? <clears throat> yeah, I, I think part of the challenge was just beginning was convincing people that this was worthwhile. Uh, seven years ago, there was no f federal FOIA portal. There, uh, this was a very new concept, the idea of, of using the internet to file a Freedom Information Act request. Um, but I, I, you know, I think living in this country, I think the laws kind of enabled anybody. I was, I was just a kid in Boston at the time saying, wouldn't it be nice if you could do this, but over the internet as opposed to with a fax machine? And, uh, and we were able to build that. I think then sort of convincing people and showing the value of that was a challenge. I think a lot of people, when you described it to them, we went to a lot of newsrooms and they said, well, I can just, I can just send a certified letter to do this on my own. And I said, but if you put it online, more people can benefit from it. If you put it online, more people can learn from that. And instead of just being a one-to-one -one transaction, we can make this a more enriching transaction that lots of people can benefit from that. And so let me just interrupt. So that's, it's not just that you've made a request, that you've made a request on a particular subject. It's seeing the request that was made and then seeing the documents that result from that right. and sharing those Absolutely. for really, for investigative reporting, for example. Right. Yes. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that was once people could kind of see the positive impacts, once we saw we had academic researchers come and say, well, I just started Googling this and I came across these documents that were now online, and all these people started repurposing information that before would have just been filed away in a cabinet. And so explaining that value to people, that was a challenge at first, but now it's, it's something that a lot of people really benefit from. Lauren Allen. I think if I were to point out the two most surprising challenges, um, one was how quickly uh, the open government advocacy I was doing would get constrained to a specific 
um, thing. And you often then get into, especially when I was working at the Sony Foundation and we're a national organization, also working with municipalities and states, um, everyone has a different priority. And when you're trying to work in coalition or you're trying to bring together diverse stakeholders or um, you know, different professionals to come together along a specific issue, if you're coming in and you want to focus on the public release of data and you're working with advocacy groups that are more focused on public records, even though to me there really shouldn't be much of a difference between that, what's, what is data but a record, um, although asterisk, I know we could have a long conversation about that, you know, suddenly we're, we're splitting hairs and it found it very, it found it very challenging to figure out, um, especially as an external advocate, like not working within a single state context, which I know you don't either, you work in many different states, but that became a really interesting negotiation and the, uh, appear to that is this, the way in which we would split open data from public records laws. It was often much easier, especially working with government partners, to approach them about open data laws. But as soon as we discussed uh, making an amendment to law or looking at how to interpret public records laws in such a way as to be inclusive of open data, we hit a lot of roadblocks. And uh, I expect that did surprise you. Yes, um, and you know, my uh, coming from a journalist background, I didn't want to approach open data unless we could be looking at public records laws. Um, we use the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press and their resources all the time, and I, I really saw that as a point where we could be unified. But it ended up being very divisive, especially in the first few years of this type of advocacy. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but but Josh, let's let's hear from you about your challenges, because um, it sounds like you turned what um, might have been um, a big challenge, that is continually finding out what you didn't know, and then letting other people know what you were finding out. I mean, that in itself, and how do you do that, and what's the best vehicle for that, and how do you penetrate, particularly, how do you penetrate the U.S. Congress? Um, Talk yeah. a little bit about that. Yeah, I um, so uh, I don't I don't want to minimize the sort of people problems that I've also encountered, um, uh, but on the on the sort of technical and like implementation side, um, yeah. So uh, how does Congress work? I had no idea when I started working on this. Uh, it turns out that like there's no actual way a bill becomes a law. That's not a thing. Uh, or you know there are <laughs> you thousands. Mean that, that little video doesn't the, really the, help. Yeah, yeah. So the video is actually surprisingly good and accurate. Um, it's just that there are so many ways that that the process works. Um, so so one like acquiring the information. I had asked the Library of Congress, which had. Uh, and has a big database of all the bills in Congress. Can I just have the database? That would make it a lot easier than like clicking a couple thousand times to collect the information. They're like, no. <laughs> uh, and so 15 years later, like last month, they finally said yes, uh, and, and that's a whole story. Um, but so gathering the data, figuring out what is the right sort of data model uh, to uh, to capture what it is that Congress does, like what are, what are the steps that a bill goes through to become a law, uh, who can be the sponsor of an amendment, um, fun fact, a committee can be the sponsor of an amendment, not just a, an actual member of Congress. Um, so, so sort of sticking with it and working through these kind of like questions of under, turning, turning the understanding into data um, is, uh, was sort of a, a long-term challenge. And then on top of it, taking the data and figuring out, okay, how do I present it in a way that um, hopefully doesn't make things worse by confusing people uh, and, uh, and maybe actually explains the process a bit. Um, and when I've confused people uh, uh, trying to fix it. So my Twitter stream over the last 24 hours is about people who think that there was a law passed in 2012 that makes it illegal to have a protest at a Trump rally because he's now protected by the Secret Service. And, like this is a very complicated legal issue which GovTrack can have a small role in clarifying. Uh, and as not a lawyer, I should be like not clarifying the law uh, in that way, but. Uh, <laughs> I bet a lot of people try and tell you um, yeah. What that means. Yeah, they, they sure do. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, so, so pretending to be a lawyer on TV is sort of like, I guess, what I do, and uh, <laughs> trying to not, you know, trying to do that reasonably well. Um, uh, there's, there's one other, I kind of want to mention that. Uh, so uh, besides GovTrack, I also have a startup called if.then.fund, uh, which is basically like if a member of Congress votes the way you want, then fund their reelection. And um, this is sort of this is a, a, a way to sort of get into user uh, citizen engagement uh, in, a, in a different aspect in like campaign finance, which is not 
open records, um, but it's open government. And uh, one of the hard things there is how do you how do you build a, a tool that like works in the space of campaign finance? That's actually a huge technical challenge too. And I partnered with someone that had built it. Like it takes sort of years to build up the technical systems that you need in order to kind of model what's happening in government and then start to uh, uh, start to interact with it in hopefully useful ways. And finding the right people who can help you do that mm -hmm. too. Yeah. 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 So um, you've all been you've all been successful in in different in different ways, and yet um, uh, the core story here is about um, trying to to assist other people in seeing into what you've been able to see um, and perhaps bre breaking into um, uh, areas that haven't uh, that haven't been um, uh, haven't really been opened before um, I was intrigued Lauren Ellen with your um, I guess your epiphany that perhaps the audience that you were going after maybe was not the audience that needed the help the most, um, and that um, you know we all we all come into these projects um, into w with with what we already know and what we think everybody else knows, and that sort of intersection of of um, um, starting even with the copyright, the intersection of copyright and law and techno technology, as Josh did, uh, can be can open all of our eyes. Um, what, Lauren Ellen, would you um, see as your next big challenge? If you're, um, particularly as I understand it, you're working a lot on civic engagement. Um, where do you go from here? What are you hoping to see? Uh, <laughs> that's that's and kind I know of you can't see people. No, that's perfect. Much. That was my like looking into the distance. Um, that's that's been a lot of my focus over the last year, uh, in part because I see the engagement challenge as twofold, and I want to make sure to like talk about the complexity of this. On one hand, um, to use like a, a physical space reality, we need libraries. We need this like constant access to information using whatever best standards that we develop, using technology um, right at its peak. Like we just need the, like we need the records online. We need certain standards of um, equitable access to them. And this should be a good that exists. Whether I think whether or not people are entering the doors of a library, a public library is a public good. But at the same time, no library opens up in a neighborhood that serves that neighborhood if they don't go knocking on doors figuring out how they could um, expand their collection based on public interest. Like, no, no library is ever just like kind of uh, dropped into the middle of a space. It integrates into the physical space. And my challenge that I'm, I'm pursuing is how do we do that in terms of, um, let's zoom out of open government. Let's talk about our democracy. How do we do that in terms of participation in our government? Because to me, an, an open government is this concept that we have people interacting and, and building their democracy democracy together. That's, that's what a democracy is. It's something that we've built together. And um, the work that I'm pursuing is in that invitation space of participation. People won't show up at a party unless you invite them. And you won't design a party that's meant for people that aren't just like you unless you invite people into the design process. So a lot of my work uh, now focuses on this concept of building with and not for. Uh, I was originally looking at it in the space of technology in, um, with the concept that we can't really build equitable systems if we don't enable that system in the creation of our practice, right? We're not going to build government reform systems that work for everyone if we don't find ways of including more people than who are currently in the room in the process of creation. And I'm starting to... Um, learning from other advocates and other organizers who do this practice in a number of different fields, ranging from the citizen arts to citizen science. Um, this is a pretty common practice. I think we, we're used to seeing it in technology branded in very fun ways, like co-creation and co-design, but it's a completely old practice that is innate to being human and figuring out ways of working together. And I'm going to be piloting a project with New America that explores this concept in the context of Washington, DC. 
And in fact, we'll be answering the question, what relevance does an institution like New America have? Um, what service can it provide to the city? And instead of starting from the presumption that we have something that the city innately needs, we're gonna be looking at the civic activity present in DC uh, and what kind of support people express that they need, what kind of support is evident through a co-design process. Uh, even though it'll be focused on starting up a think tank in, uh, potentially starting up a think tank or adapting a think tank to serve the community or not. Maybe we'll learn that there is no purpose um, that like the community is taking care of. I hope that this is one way of modeling as an external government actor, ways that you can go to the community instead of constantly asking the community to come to you. And that this can be extrapolated for other practices, um, both in government reform and in technology more broadly. Well, certainly uh, libraries would be a natural partner in that and uh yeah, we're excited to work. Uh, well, nothing is official, but we, we hope to be working with DC Public Library as part of Good. this. That's great. Um, Josh, where, where, where are you going from here? When you leave this building, after looking at the original Freedom of Information Act? Back on the green line, I guess. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, so there are, there are um, certain things that I think are important and that, that I hope that I and others that I work with make progress on. So um, access to uh, information about um, uh, the justice system. Uh, what are the laws that apply to me? How do I find that out? How do I understand it once I've gotten there? Um, so that this is this is an incredible public records question. Uh, on top of it, a, a sort of like interpretation uh, question, um, and um, that's sort of on the GovTrack side. On the if then fund side, um, definitely looking at um, how can citizens be. Let me, okay, let me take a step back. Uh, I want citizens to be the best citizens that they can be when they have a issue that they want to advocate for or change, or when they have something that they want to do with government. Uh, I want them to be able to, to, to do that and act on that effectively. And we're very far away from being able to actively do that, uh, to be able to effectively do that, right? So starting with not knowing what the law is, because it's very difficult to figure out what the law actually says, to knowing how can I engage. Like, should I write a letter to my member of Congress? I tell people, I don't know. I don't actually know. No one knows if that's effective. No one knows what the point of that is. Uh, we have to figure that out. Um, so that's... That's kind of where, where I hope to be going. Uh, so whether campaign finance is sort of a, a useful and effective way for people to, to participate in right now, I think so. Uh, so I'm gonna keep pushing on that. Um, uh, but um, uh, future questions are always fun, right? I think the, the future of, of what we're all doing is, is really a, a big open question right now. So for one, questions that Lauren Ellen has been raising uh, for the last couple of years, uh, have been very influential in the open government movement, and we're starting to realize that, huh, like there's there's bigger things to be worrying about. Uh, and I think we're in the middle of maybe a little crisis of what this movement is actually doing. Um, there's there's that. There's whether work that we do is um, financially uh, supportable in any way. The, or, the organizations that tend to fund this, uh, some of them have financial trouble. Some of, one has recently closed down. Uh, so uh, it's, it's really not clear how without a business model, which is a word that we don't like to talk about, uh, these things can actually keep going. So there are a lot of open questions in the future that we're gonna have to figure out. In the next 40 minutes. Just yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, you've solved it, I hope. What's it? You're yeah. the last one to talk on this question, so if you don't have an answer, we're... Michael. <laughs> well, Besides uh, JetBlue. <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, so I think, I think the sustainability question is, is one that, that we've sort of been thinking about since we started. And, and I think when Muckrock started, it was very unusual in the fact that um, we charged users of our service, usually money, but we also offer people opportunities to help with other people's requests in exchange for free requests and that sort of thing. Because I think sustainability is, is a challenge and, and we want to figure out could we build something that the community of users and the community of, of broader supporters thought was worthwhile? Um, and six years later, uh, we've at least gotten enough to, to keep stumbling forward, and so that's a good sign. Um, I think as far as our next step, one of the things when we launched, we really focused on the user end. We wanted to make requesting easier for the end user, whether that's a reporter or whether that's somebody in the public or whether that's another kind of professional who needs access to this, 
our big focus was we want to be the best way to file, track, and share a public records request. Uh, now we're seeing that there's, there's two sides to that equation. So we're trying to figure out what can we do to help agencies better manage our requests, better requ manage requests in general. Um, so our first sort of goal is sort of figure out how can we better work with agencies? How can we make our users file better requests so it's, we see fewer requests for all documents ever? Um, and sort of what can we do to sort of improve how agencies respond to requests, make their lives easier, and make it easier for them to do the good work that they want to do. Um, so that's, that's sort of our first part of that goal. And then the second part of that goal is, is sort of understanding, and this is something um, both my co-panelists have kind of talked about, is sort of how do you make this information useful and meaningful to that community? Uh, so Muckrock's published over 800,000 pages of documents and hours of video, and and tons of databases, what can we do to make sure that the most effective public use of that information is being made? Um, because, I, you know, I'm ashamed to admit, I haven't personally read all 800,000 pages, <laughs> um, and I'm sure not a whole lot of people have. Um, so what can we do, uh, similar to the archives project with public transcriptions, what can we do to tap an audience that's interested in this to make better use of it? to not only sort of get the information out there, but to put it to work. I think that's, that's one of the big challenges that I'm super interested in, is sort of making sure that uh, data isn't public just for the sake of data, that we're not open for the sake of openness, but we're open for the sake of having the strongest possible democracy we can. Um, and so that's something we've been looking at and, and working a lot in, and I'm really excited about that challenge. It's um, a big challenge, but uh, I think we all um, really will be eager to see, see that happen. Um, we have just a, about seven minutes, I believe, if I'm keeping my time correctly. And I wonder if we might have time for a few comments and uh, questions from people in the audience today. Um, Nate Jones. <laughs> okay. Real quick, um, you guys kind of evoke a lot of what I think the government was hoping to bring in with 18F, which is kind of a new startup tech part within the government of new technology thinking. So any of you or all of you, I know they have really not that much money that they can use towards FOIA. But if they had to use it and you, you were in charge and you said put all your resources to fix this one thing or build this one thing that 18F should build, do um, you guys have any thoughts on what they should do to improve the Freedom of Information Act? Great. Could each of you answer that? Answer Nate's good question. What would you do? I, I want to um, maybe say, so my understanding of 18F is that they're primarily um, sort of contractors for other agencies, right? So they don't actually decide what to do themselves. They wait for an agency to bring them a job. Uh, and the DOJ uh, brought them a job to work on FOIA, but I don't know what happened with that. Uh, so, uh, so then there's, so th there's separately the U.S. Digital Service, which is much more about um, the Obama and, so, so 18F is within GSA, it's non-political, there's the USDS, which is political, and they can sort of go in and fix things, I guess, if that's even a thing one can do. Uh, but that might be my whole comment. <laughs> um, yeah, I feel like there's been a lot of attempts to remake on the web. And I, I think I would, you know, one of the things I appreciate about one of the last times in the ring was a public design process. So I don't think I have like a specific recommendation I'd want to go into in terms of 18F, but I um, will be here as the person who says that the small design team does not know everything that the user needs. And I would love to see if 18F can be, if it's even possible, whichever entity, I would love to see them find ways to be really creative in getting more engagement and involvement proactively from non-governmental organizations um, and also from non-organizations from community groups that may work on FOIA, uh, whether or not they're officially incorporated, if that's possible. Expanding, in other words, expanding out from the people who are nor who are usually the stakeholders in yes. this area. Yes, look for unconventional, like you're, there's always like a, you know, usual suspect lineup. I think we listed many of the kinds of professions that you'd go for. That's not necessarily representative of the people who would use FOIA. Um, now or in the future when it's theoretically fixed. Yeah. 
So I think, I think that's a great question. I'm a huge fan of what 18F has been doing. Um, and I would say that first, I don't think, I would say that there's actually two different projects that I would love to see 18F uh, continue to tackle. And one of those, I think, is, is fixing FOIA, I don't think involves building a nice new FOIA portal. I don't think it involves really great FOIA management software. I think it involves tackling the deeper issues around archives management, data management. Um, and I think that starts with better procurement uh, at the federal level. I think that's a challenge that 18F is doing a lot of really fascinating work with the micro procurements and, and sort of crowdsourcing and sort of smaller, more agile procurement method. And I think long term, that's going to have a huge impact in terms of getting data digital, having more efficient tools being put and better tools put into the hands across the federal government. So I think that is something they're doing and I'm super excited and I hope mm -hmm. that that process continues and succeeds. And then I think uh, records management and better services delivery. Um, I think one of the things is users today, uh, a lot of people use you know Gmail or, or uh, some other kind of consumer internet and where if you want to, if I want to search my past 10 years of email, it takes me two seconds. A lot of agencies aren't using something that good um, and for a lot of good reasons, but I think 18F has also been looking at things like, hey, can we build and centrally deploy better email services? Can we build and centrally deploy all sorts of better digital native services? Um, and I think if those services are built by 18F with a transparency mandate in mind from the start, 10 years down the road, we can get to a point where, where FOIA isn't a huge burden, but it's something that's built into the process. And so I would like to see those two initiatives really succeed. And I think they're, they're starting to do some really good work there. Thanks. Thank you. And I, I think with that shout out for records management, we should thank our panelists. Thank you, Miriam, and all of our panelists. Before we move on to the next panel, we will take a 10 minute break. I encourage you to stop by the display case outside of the theater to see the copy of the original FOIA signed by LBJ. Please be back in your seats by 2.15? 2.05. To hear from our next panel who will be discussing technology and innovation from inside the government.
Okay, welcome back. I hope you all had a chance to see the FOIA on display. So we just heard the perspective of those outside of government, but now it's time to turn our attention to the complimentary open government efforts taking place inside the government. Sabrina Williams is a digital service expert with the U.S. Digital Service Team at the White House. In her role with USDS, she has worked on projects with several agencies, including as a product lead for College Scorecard, an online tool that helps students and their families make smart decisions about where to enroll for higher education. Pam Wright is the Chief Innovation Officer at the National Archives and Records Administration. As such, she is responsible for igniting innovation projects across the agency, as well as formulating and implementing NARA's strategic direction for, for providing online public access to NARA's holdings. David Zvenich used to consider himself a lawyer who knew how to code. Now he's a coder who has written legal briefs. <laughs> Formerly general counsel to the Council of the District of Columbia, Mr. Zvenich is currently working on ways to improve how the government purchases digital services at 18F. Moderating this panel is Sean Vitka, who serves as counsel for demand progress and fight for the future. Mr. Vitka is also a fellow at XLab, which aims to drive digital equity through policy intervention, technology innovation, and study of upcoming risks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, all right. So uh, thanks for the introductions to everybody. It makes my life uh, even easier. Um, again, my name's Sean. I'm going to be letting the three of these people uh, talk about what they're working on for uh, a little bit of time, and then we're gonna come back. I'll ask a couple questions, uh, and then we'll le open it up for, for Q&A. Uh, it's worth saying, though, that as somebody who has sent in a lot of requests uh, or demands of government, uh, it is very dependent and very different based on who you get, who hears your request. And the people who do it well tend to do it very well. And so I'm very happy to have these three people, because um, they're the people who will be leading by example, uh, and are already leading by example, in terms of opening up government. So Sabrina's gonna go first, uh, and uh, hopefully the PowerPoint system works flawlessly. All right, let's give this a whirl. Is that it? Oh, okay. Oh, oh no, I went too far. Okay, cool. So um, my name is Sabrina Williams. I am a digital services expert at USDS. Um, Really, I'm just an engineer. Before I came here, I was a software engineer at Google. And so I came to government in October. And my first project has been College Scorecard. So I figured I'd tell you a little bit about it, because that is an example of us actually opening up some data. Um, so if you go, if, to understand the College Scorecard program, you need to understand that the goal is to engage and educate potential college students of any age or background and those that advise them to find schools that are best suited for them. So a little bit of background here is that it turns out that a college degree is really the surest path to middle class. Um, if you look at millennials age 25 to 32, if they have a bachelor's degree, the unemployment rate is 3.8%. 3 but if they only have a, bachelor, or a high school diploma, it is 12.2%. Um, similarly, if you have a bachelor's degree, you'll, you'll earn over a million dollars more over the course of your lifetime. And the one that I find particularly jarring is that of those millennials, those who only have a high school diploma, 21.8% of them live in poverty. So there is a real, tangible, um, a real tangible gain of having a college degree. And a lot of people don't really know that that value exists, especially those who are first generation or low income. And so the president wanted to create a tool where we could more easily show metrics that show that value and help people make more informed choices and also um, help the public know, help the public hold schools more accountable for the quality and cost of their programs. So how do you, how do you succeed in a goal like that? Um, so what we did is we went out and we talked to people. We talked to parents, teachers, students, advisors, counselors, policymakers. We talked to people who had written letters to the president. We talked to people who, my favorite story, is in the early days of Scorecard, it predates me a little bit, but um, and it was spring break of last spring, and the early Scorecard team was out on the National Mall just accosting people coming in and out of the Smithsonian Museums with like paper iPhone prototypes, like, how do you look for colleges, and would this work for you? And so a lot of user-centered design. 
Um, and what we found out is that there's really sort of three audiences. There are students, teachers, parents, advisors, counselors, who need that data given to them in a palatable, easy to understand format. There are also policymakers, journalists, um, and in the schools themselves, and researchers who need that data given to them in sort of a researchable format. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the developers who need that data made available to them via, in a programmable format. So we ended up giving the data in three different ways. We have the College Scorecard Consumer Site, which is how students, parents, advisors, all those sorts of people get access to the data, it's a visualization of it. We have the data available in a CSV file so that you know, people who are used to Excel and pivot tables and whatever it is they do with those things um, can use the, that. And then we have um, the API, which is how programmers can use it. And here's just, as you can see, it's just a, it really is a, a visualization of the data. If you were to click on one of those schools, you would see a whole lot more information. Um, but what's interesting here is that you can sort of get an at-a-glance view of what value some schools might be providing. So, for example, if it has a very high uh, annual cost, but a very low salary after leaving, there's a chance that you might not be able to pay off your student loans when you graduate. So it's something that you need to take an extra look at versus a school that may have a lower cost and higher salary, where you probably will be able to pay off your student loans a little bit easier. A um, couple things I want to mention here is that, and I find it fascinating that I have to mention this, but <laughs> um, so the, it turns out that it's not a common practice to have the consumer site be driven by the API. And so this is one of the first examples in government where like the cons all this UI gets updated whenever we update the API. So we just did a new data drop last week. So this is all updated data based on that because we use the API rather than having two separate systems, one providing an API and then a whole separate thing running the consumer site. Um, and the, I'll just give you a couple stats. It was launched by the president at his weekly address in September. There have been over a million users, over 6.5 .5 million page views. And the thing that I really like about Scorecard is that we did user-centered design for not only the consumer site, but also for the API. So while we, were it, while we were developing it, we had a beta program for API users. So at the same time the consumer site launched, seven other sites were using our API that launched at the same time. And the, it, was, it was a far superior API having gotten that data and that feedback while we were developing than it would have been had we not listened to other people. And on top of that, my favorite, favorite thing is that, you know, government sites can, we, they have to serve everybody equally, right? So we can't tailor the experience to one group versus another group, but other people can. And so, for example, one of the sites that launched was in Spanish. And so um, it's really, it really does help us get the data out to the people who need it. And other folks using our API can sort of help tailor the experience to make it more useful for whoever might be using the data. So that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, so I am super excited to talk to you guys today about what's going on at the National Archives. Um, I have been with the Archives for about 15 years. I was a researcher before I came to the National Archives, so I kind of come at it from a, a user's point of view and all this discussion that we've had today about human-centric design and, and users is so important, and I think it's something that goes hand in hand with any technology that we use. I have to say that about the last six years or so have been the most exciting time to work at the National Archives, and um, uh, that this is due to great leadership in our organization, as well as the incredible changes that we're seeing in technology, and we still see them today, and it is just fun to work at the National Archives. So let's talk about it a little bit. You just did that one? That one? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so, uh, David mentioned this before, the archivist mentioned this, that um, 
in 2009, President Obama, when he was um, welcoming senior staff and cabinet secretaries to the White House, said, our commitment to openness means more than simply informing the American people about how decisions are made. It means recognizing that government does not have all the answers and that public officials need to draw on what citizens know. And uh, that, that's kind of been the basis. I, I learned that from um, the archivist. I le learned about this quote from him. And open government at the National Archives has kind of been uh, based on that quote. Um, Right now, we're um, co-hosting co the open agency, open government uh, working group that's interagency across agencies, along with Corey Zarek. And at these meetings, agencies are working together to develop transparency, participation, and collaboration, those three pillars of open government within and across our organizations. And a lot of the discussion there is about the technology that we use with it. Um, the, our strategic goals for our agency that we currently have, they're really grounded in those open government principles of transparency, participation, and collaboration. And our goals are to make access happen, connect with cu customers, maximize our value to the nation, and build our future through our people. And technology that we're using now is supporting all of those goals and really changing them up. So I'll talk to you about that. Uh, this is uh, supposed to be a representation of some of the work that we do at the National Archives in that rich, rich soil in the bottom. It's supposed to, uh, is an analogy for the records that we have and the roots of this tree that is there go deep into our records. That trunk, that, that trunk is the catalog. It, it is um, the authority records and the standardization that we do across our agency keep that trunk strong. And then the fruit of our, all of our efforts are the various platforms that we are able to reshare our records on. So it's no longer just about sharing our records, it's about the resharing of our records, it's about the engagement with our records and what people can do um, when they work with us. So that's what that's supposed to represent. So I just wanna give you a little uh, example from uh, 2009 to today. In 2009, we had one blog, it was a records management blog, uh, and we were very proud of it. Today, we have 165 channels on 16 social media platforms uh, with folks from across the agency working on those. Uh, we seem to be especially effective in Tumblr, where we have over a quarter of a million subscribers on today's document, which is our uh, Tumblr um, blog. And we've been named by Time Magazine um, and the Tumblr community as one of the best blogs on the site. Our content on these platforms received uh, almost a quarter million views in, in, in 2015, and the social media activities placed the agency really out in front among government agencies and archival institutions. We now have over 200 of our staff who are contributing regularly to content on these external platforms. So we've just kind of, technology was able to kind of crack open the institution, open us up. Communications used to be through one silo of the communication office, and now it's everybody's responsible for some communication. Uh, I said go. Okay. So in 2011, we launched an experiment that we called the Citizen Archivist Dashboard. Our goal was to gather projects that the public could work on in one spot. This is the homepage. Um, it has a call to action and some encouragement to participate. As you can see by the tags along the bottom, users are invited to tag and transcribe, edit articles, and upload digital copies. And so um, uh, this is where we're trying to kind of pull our experiments together, but it also then spawns the success, uh, successful experiments then kind of go deeper into the work that we do and, and changes that we've made to our catalog started out as pilot experiments on this dashboard. Uh, this is an exciting one that we're doing. We just launched in January. It's called History Hub. And um, this new platform may be thought of as an external collaboration network, a place where subject matter experts from across the National Archives can en engage with researchers and the public to share information, work more easily together, and find people based on their experiment, uh, experience and interests. So the platform offers discussion boards, blogs, profiles, and other interactive tools for communication and collaboration. And we aim to use the History Hub to explore new ways of connecting with and serving customers interested in historical topics relating to our holdings. 
Um, so the hub provides us a platform that we'd really like to work with other cultural organizations uh, together with, like the Smithsonian Library of Congress, to offer the public a one-stop shop for crowdsourcing information about American history. Uh, but we really don't know what the hub is going to be used for, and that's what innovation is about. You have to leave wiggle room for, for the public to come and use these tools in ways that works for them, and it may not be what you had planned. So we just know that all of our great plans will for surely miss some of uh, the new ways the public will use the tool. Um, and uh, already, uh, our open government working group uh, is planning to use this tool as a way to, to work together across agencies. So uh, it's something we, we hadn't envisioned when we first launched the tool. We're uh, using this tool to the end of May, and then we'll do lessons learned and, um, and figure out a way forward on, on how uh, we'll work with this. So why are we doing all this stuff? Well, it's really about bringing the records to the people where they are and allowing them to use the records in the way they want to use them. And so in 2015, we had uh, 80 million page views on archives.gov and 1 million views on our online public access catalog. But you compare that to more than 250 million views on places like YouTube, Facebook, Fl Flickr, and Tumblr. But the amazing one is Wikipedia, of course, where we have relatively very few records on it that, that regularly get over around a billion views every year. So, you know, there's no um, comparison to that. Um, and I think, oh, I have one more. This one I'm really excited about. This one just uh, launched, too. Um, uh, this is the digital analytics program in GSA's Office of Citizen Services and Innovative Technologies. NARA got to be one of the first 10 um, agencies to get um, the code on our site so that people could see in real time uh, how, you know, how many people are looking at our site and what they're doing. The drop down at the top of the page allows you to select an individual agency, only 10. NARA is one of them, along with NASA. You know, the big shots. We're, we're right in there. <laughs> So there's also a seven-day, 30-day view. You get to you know, slice and dice and take a look at what's going on. It's really great for the public, but it's great for us around our agency to go, why, you know, what are the people looking at? What are the records that they're interested in? What platforms are people gravitating to? And how do we change that as we go, or how do we use that information to improve our site and make good changes going forward? So the, those guiding pillars from open government of transparency and participation and collaboration have really, along with new technology, kind of turbocharged the mission of the agency that we already had, which is to open up you know, um, uh, federal historical records to the public. And I think I will end with that one and let you go with that. Thanks. Hey everyone, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Dave Svenich. Uh, I'm the Director of Acquisition at 18F. Um, and I don't have slides, but actually you've seen two 18F projects in the previous slide. So the previous slide was uh, analytics.usa.gov, which was an 18F project, um, and also the College Scorecard, which 18F uh, helped out on. Um, it's, it's a real thrill to, to be here to talk about uh, transparency in government um, and, and sort of 18F's brand of openness. Um, you know, 18F is a relatively new organization. Uh, we started in March of 2014, so we were around for two years now. Um, we're actually writing, as we speak, we're writing our two-year anniversary uh, blog post. Um, and one of the things that's really inspiring about 18F is that we are an organization that's committed to working in the open from day one. Um, and that manifests itself in a lot of different ways. Um, one of the most significant is that we have an open source policy uh, that says that when we are developing software, um, for other parts of the United States government. Not only do we open source the code, um, but we default to opening it from the very first day so that when we're working on a project, we can create this community uh, and let taxpayers and let our stakeholders and let really users know where we're going and allow users to contribute. And I actually have a cool story about that later uh, in, in, the, in the talk. Um, in addition to, to being open from day one in terms of our actual work, uh, we're also open from day one in terms of how we communicate with the public. Um, so one of the, one of the notes that Pam said about communication is no longer one person's responsibility, it's a shared responsibility. Um, it's something that was really new to me at 18F and something that I think a lot of people could learn from, um, which is that at 18F, outreach is not something that's one person or one team's job, it's the whole team's job. Um, I'm still trying to pin down the exact number, um, but 
we had, I think at this point, something like 100 different contributors to our blog. Um, and to give you a sense, that means that 100 different individuals at 18F have written something that has gone onto our blog, and we're a team of about 160 people to give you a sense of scale. Um, so everyone feels the, the sense of uh, engagement, and they also feel the ability to, to communicate what, what they've learned, um, what they uh, want to see in the world, and we have a very liberal approach to letting people have their voice uh, be heard, um, both internally, and then also we try to engage externally through uh, mediums like Twitter and beyond. Um, and also on GitHub, we, we use, uh, we work with developers and we work with uh, designers and we work in uh, the space where they are. And so we have a lot of engagement uh, with, with GitHub and beyond. Um, but there's also a couple of different things that I think are really interesting. And uh, this is where I'm gonna sort of pivot a little bit in the talk. There are two, um, two areas in which we've been trying to push boundaries a little bit. And I think they're really exciting. Um, the first is around open project management. Um, and so the first example of this in sort of a very public way was around the EPA e-manifest project. Um, so as someone, I think Josh noted, 18F is not, um, we don't come up with our own ideas. We work with customer agencies and partner agencies who have a need. Um, and so usually you'll have uh, someone come in, say I have a project or something that I've been mandated to do, can you help me build it? And we always ask that they have an empowered product owner to make sure that that someone can make choices about the direction of the, of the product. Um, we worked out uh, an arrangement with EPA um, that had a, a project called E-Manifest. And I won't bore you about the details about the E-Manifest project, but there's an important, uh, important fact here, which is that it was a very highly visible project. It involved OMB, it involved Congress, it involved regulated industry, it involved a lot of different people who were very concerned about the direction of this project. Um, and it was considered a high-risk project. There were a lot of, uh, a lot of challenges with getting the project to, uh, up to speed. Um, and EPA partnered uh, with, with us to build, uh, build the initial phases of this project. Um, and they did something that was truly radical, at least as far as I can tell, which is they opened up their Trello board. Now, if you've never heard of Trello, that's fine. I hadn't heard of Trello before I came to eight and f really. Never used it, really. Um, but we use it a lot at eight and f and it's basically a project management board. Um, and you can identify what, what you're working on, what's been worked on, what's coming down the pipe. Um, and we opened up the Trello board, not just for our own team, but to the public um, from day one. So you could see what we were doing as we were building the product. And there was a lot of, you know, what is this gonna mean? Is this gonna be like scary? This is a scary thing. Um, as it turned out, it was a fantastic choice um, because people could actually see the project and they could see where it was going. And I, I, I don't have my notes and I would show you the quote, but um, there, were, there were really positive reactions from it. No longer was this a situation from the Hill saying, what are you doing? Because they could see what we were doing. No longer is this a sense of industry saying, I'm concerned about the direction that you're going because it actually participate in the direction that we were going. Um, so it was a very different way of approaching um, uh, project management, and it was a very successful one. And happily, it's been forked, and now no longer just an 18F thing. Now Treasury um, is doing something very similar with the Data Act. So uh, they just relaunched, uh, and I forget the exact URL, but if you, you know, Google around for it a little bit, Data Act, uh, federal, I think it's Federal Spending Transparency at GitHub, you'll find their, uh, their new data activity, it's very clever, data activity, um, their data activity site, um, and if you go to the about, uh, about portion of the site, you'll actually note that they, uh, not only do they have a bunch of GitHub repos, which is cool, um, but they also have their JIRA project management now open to the public. So pause and observe, this is now Treasury opening up not just their own project, but ultimately something for all of the United States government to see how the Data Act is going to be implemented. And if that wasn't cool enough, something really remarkable happened relatively recently, which is that a person who is totally unrelated to the government, just a person in the, out, uh, in the public, submitted a user story that's now part of the project management board. So this is real, this is a really different feel. This is no longer the government imposing even on itself. It's learning from the public about how we can build our products better for ourselves and for, and for real users. Um, and it's a, very cool thing, um, and we're learning as we continue to, to go, and I expect that you'll see this as a continued pattern. Um, so project management's cool. Um, there's also an area that I'm personally interested in, acquisitions is my, is my bag. Um, we're working a lot with procurement, um, and so we've done a couple of really interesting experiments with procurement, and I'll share them with you now. 
Um, the first is uh, around the Agile BPA. Um, so if you haven't been involved with acquisition, you may not know what a BPA is. You're better off for it. Um, but if you are interested, a BPA is a blanket purchase agreement. Um, and it was our first major effort at procurement uh, for 18F. Um, and there were a bunch of things that were really neat about this from, a, from an engagement and a transparency perspective, but I'll highlight two. Um, the first is that we had a really robust industry engagement um, where we worked with industry to explain what was that we were thinking. We had an industry, industry engagement day. We had a series of blog posts. We tweeted about it. And we had about 200 submissions, which is crazy considering this was only a $25 million award. Um, so, and it's not even really an award, it's just an agreement to do future awards. So 200 companies for a $25 million thing, that's a crazy amount of engagement in the federal government. Um, and we ultimately got a remarkable results, and you don't have to take my word for it. The other part that was really neat about the Agile BPA is that we asked vendors to submit their bids, not just to us, but to submit them to the public. Um, and the day that I really knew that something was different and something that was really remarkable was the day that I saw a team tweeting about its, or it was actually Periscope. They were Periscoping their, the development of an app that they were submitting as a, a response to a government contract. I was like, this is all crazy. I can't believe what's <laughs> happening. Um, you know, there's a hashtag for a, a blanket purchase agreement. This is weird. Um, but uh, the remarkable, re truly remarkable products. Um, and, um, you know, the interesting thing is that we learned from that experiment too. It, we had eight protests for the Agile BPA, so that was like a lot. Now, granted, there were like, again, hundreds of submissions. Um, we got eight, eight protests, got through all of them, and no adverse, uh, no corrective action taken, so yay. Yeah. Um, great lawyering, um, and, um, and it's great contracting office, and um, it was a really great experience. Um, the, but it was, you know, the products on the Agile BPA were fantastic, and we learned a lot about how to work with vendors and how we can uh, work with each other uh, to get a better, better outcome. Um, and the other part that I wanted to focus on is uh, the micro-purchase platform, which somebody mentioned earlier, too. Um, so the micro-purchase platform was an effort to, to buy uh, custom-built software uh, for $3,500 or less. Um, micro-purchase is the, the dollar threshold at which we can use a P card and not have to go through extensive procurement processes. Um, and so we had a little experiment to see if we could um, purchase uh, custom software. Um, and I remember when we did the first blog, just to bring it all full circle, I wrote a blog post and I was able to write in the blog post, this might be a terrible idea. Um, and just the moment that I didn't get fired told me everything that I needed to know about 18F. You know, who writes, this might be a terrible idea and doesn't get canned for, for doing it. Um, it turns out that I, I was able to not get canned, so that was good. Um, and um, what's been really fascinating about it is that not only have we taken the approach of building, uh, just you know, using this platform, but we also have an API that we make a lot of our decisions. So one, you know, I've talked to friends, they say, how do you manage all the data calls? You get all these data calls, you have people asking, how many bidders did you have? What was the lowest bid? All these other questions. And I was like, well, I use the API. Um, you have uh, a bunch of, um, we actually allow for people to bid by API, which is kind of a neat thing. So that's like the future of federal procurement is you can, you can bid on a contract with an API. It's very clever. Um, and now you can actually see not just what we've seen, but again, we've created a public-facing um, uh, public platform so you can see what other bidders have done. Um, so not only do you know what your bid was, but you can see what other, bids, uh, other bidders' prices were, and we can start getting some real data around how federal procurement uh, code is bought. Um, and we're extending this not just to the micro-purchase platform, but we announced uh, it sort of fortuitously happened today, but we announced a, a draft of a transparency policy for, uh, for the Agile BPA, uh, which will include things like the RFQs and the questions and answers and the ultimate price awarded um, and mean and standard deviation uh, data for, for bids. So it's very, um, it's, a lot of things are happening in this, but one of the things that I sort of want to close with is that um, 18F's approach to, to openness is not that we have all the answers. Um, it's fundamentally a recognition that we are learning from our partners uh, within the government and outside of the government. Um, and one of the, one of the sort of most gratifying aspects of, of being a public servant within 18F is that I've had so many peers who either were part of a different agency or worked with agencies and have come in and say, I want to make the United States government um, the, best, uh, the best institution in the world. Um, and restore sort of our, uh, our sense of uh, pride and uh, mission and, and technology. And so far, 
so far so good. And so thank you for, for having me and um, yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you all. Uh, so I'm going to ask one, maybe two questions. I'd like to keep time for Q&A. Um, so if you want to do Q&A, queue up at the microphone. Um, from, from everybody uh, on this one, uh, Pam, you said something about the last six years yeah. have been the most interesting. Yeah. And I think that probably squares with a lot of our, uh, on the outside, experience with government. A lot more effort in projects like these. Um, but uh, a lot, if not all, of the technology that you guys described was is not new, yeah. uh, is not six years old. And I'm really curious, what was the, what changed then, or what has changed, that you all feel has enabled you to do this, this work? And in particular, I'm curious about how everybody in this room and otherwise can learn from it so that we can see it multiplied across the many other parts of government who are not succeeding like you are. So Pam, did you, you want could, to start? Yeah. Sure. So, um, uh, well, there's a lot, I, I think that, you know, the technology is just a piece of it, and it's really about the culture change. And uh, the technology will keep changing, but it's really about a culture that, that's open and, and, and able to handle it. So I think it's, it's really about kind of making sure you can change that culture. And for us, what, worked, uh, what works well when you've got a really tight culture that doesn't want that is uh, to try a pilot and, and put, uh, I think, Piloting things helps you to put a boundary around it. It makes people feel safe. When you win with pilots, then you can move on um, and, and do other things. But I think if you start with small projects that people can get comfortable with, then I think you can start changing that culture uh, uh, as they're successful. Um, and I also think, too, that uh, the other, that's internally in an agency. Then I also think it's super important to get what your users want, so that um, so that it's not just an internal success, or it isn't, uh, you know, that that it really uh, winds up being something that you've got the public cheering for you, and they're glad for it. So uh, you're doing something that people actually want you to do, and are are happy that the government's doing. Um, and I think also it's important to get metrics so that you can prove that it's valuable to the core of the work that your agency does that you're not doing it just for the thrill of technology, which a lot of people, uh, you know, prior to any kind of culture change, will call it, you know, your toys and your, you know, the bling. But it isn't about that bling. It's about the driving the mission of the agency. Um, and then I think once you get those pilots going and they're successful, you can apply that then to larger projects. So, for example, we did a transcription tool on our Citizen Archivist dashboard. It's just a little pilot. Um, that one of my staff, Meredith Stewart, and, um, uh, and one of our students put together, kind of MacGyvered it, and uh, we learned tons from that project. And then, so we used that then, the, all, all that we learned, to drive really great requirements so that the tool that's in the catalog is useful and fun to use. And by the way, for, not just a plug and then I'll quit. Um, we have a, a transcription challenge this week for open government. So if you go to archives.gov and look up Citizen Archivist, you can get in there and um, transcribe. Uh, this week we're trying to get 2,000 pages transcribed. We hope to get to it this week. So something to do. Okay. Uh, Sabrina, do you want to? Yeah, sure. Um, so I always have to preface this with this my personal opinion. Um, <laughs> But I think the thing that kind of most helped us was healthcare.gov. <laughs> um, because no one, no one else wants to be the next healthcare.gov. So yeah. we get a lot of leverage yeah. when we go into Amen. situations. And so, um, but I would also say there's, there's something called the open data policy. And you can find out more about that online. And of particular interest is one of the documents that's managing data as an asset. Um, it's really interesting. And it's pretty cool because uh, what part of it is that data now defaults to open, which is awesome. Like you have to go through a legal thing to have a reason to not make your data open for federal agencies. Um, but there also in that document, there's information about like your data has to be machine readable and your data has to be public and your data has to be listed on the public data listing. So like if you go to any agency like ed.gov slash data or what other agencies are there? I'm blanking. Um, <laughs> HHS.gov slash data. Um, you can see the list of, of what data is available there. And if you add a .json to the end of it, you get it in JSON format. So it's pretty cool. I think 
again, personal opinion. I think the thing that is tough is not that people don't want to open data, it's that they don't know how. So there are a lot of people in government who have access to a lot of data, but they don't know what an API is. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of this is just going through and helping to educate people and providing tooling um, to help them, help them be able to provide that data more easily. So. I think that um, for, just to pick up on the culture point, I, I think that 18F uh, has, been, has been successful and, and will be successful largely because we have a great culture. Um, we, we treat each other with respect. Uh, we take each other's opinions uh, seriously. Uh, we assume that, uh, we don't assume that everyone knows everything, um, but we assume that they want to try and, and do their best. Um, and it's, it was a really telling moment for me early on um, when someone who was not high in senior leadership posed really difficult questions to senior leadership in our all hands meeting. Um, and there's a culture that everyone is, is considered to be equal and treated with dignity and respect um, and has a voice. Um, ultimately, the, you know, having, having been in other, uh, other environments in government, um, there's sort of a, sort of a, a vertical approach to things. Um, and at 18F, it's a lot more distributed in terms of the expectations, in terms of the responsibility, in terms of the, um, the, the ability to grow. Um, and you know that that doesn't just fit within the organization. We've also had a huge amount of top cover in order to facilitate that. We've had a lot of top cover from you know all the way up, um, from the president, uh, the administrator, um, both Denise Turner Roth and Dan Tangerlini have both been incredibly supportive of what we are doing and sort of fending off you know things that would be uh, sort of problems for us, I guess otherwise. Um, and you know, leadership within the organization, um, our you know, our directors have been fantastic, and uh, above them have been fantastic. So I think the the leadership question has been really important. So we've just had really strong leaders, and then they've enabled and empowered people to really make make decisions and make choices that that matter for the American public. Uh, thank you. I don't see anybody at the microphones, so I'm gonna ask one more question. But uh, I think we're done after that, just for timing reasons. I'm sorry. Um, so I, one of the things, that, a common theme that's shown up a few times is uh, a, maybe a little loosening of the reins, like a, an opportunity to, to prove uh, or your projects, perhaps. Uh, and I'm just curious if uh, that sounds very complicated. And I can only imagine that there are a lot of bosses in other agencies who really don't want to do that. Uh, maybe you have bosses that don't want to do that. And undoubtedly, there is a use for a rein. But I'm, I'm curious if there's any guidance, um, you know, Dave, you talk about your, your, your uh, uh, apparel decisions, yeah. uh, which I am very supportive of. Yeah. And, uh, He's you know, talking about the fact that I'm not wearing a suit or tie. So. Right, that, <laughs> but that's a change. I think that is that part of it? And, and is, it, is, is that how we take small steps towards getting the chance to do these big projects? I'm not sure that the, you know, the clothes. Just the tie. Yeah, just, just the, the, the tie. Um, although it, it very much is a, um, a sense of you know, one, one of the things that's interesting about 18F is that we, we, we have a lot more lawyers than you'd think, um, that we have, you know, I'm a former attorney, and so we have a significant amount of respect for the rules and sort of the, um, the, the requirements, not only the requirements of following the law, but also the spirit of following the law. Ultimately, we are a government, um, and we are bound by laws and by rules, and, uh, you know, if government were... I'm going to butcher the Madison quote, but, you know, if men were angels, right? Um, and so... Ultimately, there are, there are certain things that we cannot do um, and we should not do. But where we can and should, we're trying to seize those opportunities. And we're trying to look at things uh, creatively and sort of hack the bureaucracy, so to speak, um, to, to find ways to, to get success, to deliver greater results consistently. Um, and when we're able to do that, we can continue getting you know, more credibility and more respect for it. Um, if we start running afoul of it and start breaking rules and start breaking laws and we should have those reins pulled back in. Yeah. And so ultimately, um, this is a share, you know, sort of a shared responsibility. It's the sort of thing that we, we own as, as an organization that we have to do well. But when, when we do it well, then we want to have the ability to, to push new boundaries. Pam or Sabrina, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, so I, I think that uh, there needs to be the same uh, you know, rewards, I guess, for innovation that there is for following the rules. <clears throat> innovation and following the rules are not diametric, diametrically opposed or anything. You can follow the rules within the guidelines, but the folks that are 
making sure that we follow all the rules, get absolutely nothing, no rewards if we're innovative. It doesn't really reward them. But if we don't, if there's, if those rules are not followed, there's all kinds of punishment around it, which is, I know it's good and, and it's part of it. But what happens is, is what I see with both acquisitions and with information services is there's all the gates and all the reviews and making sure that everything is right so that you can cover everything and it's all good and it takes about two years to buy a COTS product. This just came up a couple weeks ago, you know, to do that. So, so is there a way that we can have acquisitions and um, information services folks, uh, are there ways to do a path that makes it, that is more agile, that's about the cloud, that's human-centric design, that, that can do these things um, for the outcome that we want? Because in the traditional sense right now, you can go through all that and it can take a long time and you can still have a terrible product. So we're all trying to have a really good product. I want to, and so I guess there's this tension there, and I'd love to explore how that could change or move. And Sabrina, last last comment. Um, the only thing I would add is that a lot very similar to what he said, but um, we have at USCS we have what we call hackers, and they are bureaucracy hackers. And so what we'll find is a lot of times that there are, you know, someone at an agency says we can't do this because of this regulation or this yeah. reason. Yeah. And you know, some, some of us are engineers and we come in and we're like, I don't, I don't know what that means. But the bureaucracy hackers are like, okay. And they, they know how to either understand that the rule isn't saying that we really can't do the thing or they know where they're supposed to go look to find you know, what, we can figure out ways around a lot of stuff. And so that's, um, that's been super helpful. And so I guess one thing that, the only reason I mentioned that is just to say, that there are a lot of sort of blanket, we can't do X because of Y, mm -hmm. and you should make sure that you act, that you actually know what Y is saying, because you may be able to do X. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much. Thanks, great. Thank you for sharing your insights with us, Sabrina, David, and Pam. And thank you for moderating, Sean. Thank you very much. Um, the panelists gave us a lot to think about in terms of how people both inside and outside of government are using technology to make government more transparent, collaborative, and participatory. The next few speakers on our agenda are going to share their thoughts on the future relationship between technology and open government. Our first speaker is Professor Andrew Lee, who is an associate professor of journalism at American University in Washington, DC. He is the author of The Wikipedia Revolution, How a Bunch of Nobodies Created the World's Greatest Encyclopedia, and is a noted expert in online collaboration and digital news innovation. We're just going to load his slides real fast, sorry. <laughs> Over there, if you want to use that, or if you want to stand here. Great. Thanks a lot for having me to here today. I had the privilege of being up here when we had our annual Wiki. Uh, Conference USA, which is a gathering of Wikipedia editors from all around the United States. So I thought I'd give you some, some highlights of what we talked about during that uh, conference of very dedicated and high-end Wikipedia users, but how it relates to what you folks are probably working on and what is going on in government today. So I thought I'd show you some ideas that we're exploring right now in the Wikimedia universe that really have a lot of interesting implications for folks in government. Um, as Amy said, or actually as, as uh, my introducer said, I am the author of a, 
book called The Wikipedia Revolution, How a Bunch of Nobodies Created the World's Greatest Encyclopedia. And this is the kind of the soup to nuts history of how Wikipedia came about and how it really didn't really land from outer space as this hyper successful project out of nowhere and actually built on a lot of foundations of online net culture that had been developed over 10 or 20 years. So to better understand what Wikipedia is about, you need to understand a little bit more about how it, it came to be from many online communities. And I see a lot of interesting things happening now that build on Wikipedia's community, and I thought I'd show you some of those things. Well, the first thing you should know that on January 15th, Wikipedia turned 15 years old, which is pretty impressive given that almost every other online community of note has never really been able to last more than about a decade. So the fact that Wikipedia still is going, it is surviving, it is thriving, um, and now has over 5 million articles is pretty darn impressive. Uh, here in Washington, D.C., we do a lot of what we call edit-a-thons or meetups to work with different cultural institutions and different um, NGOs to increase the quality of Wikipedia articles with experts and folks who are uh, interested in cultural heritage and preservation. So we've done events here with the Supreme Court. Uh, we've had uh, an editathon here working with the Federal Register. We work a lot with Smithsonian, Library of Congress, um, and we actually have a space in the uh, Innovation Hub here where we actually have set up a miniature exhibit about Wikipedia. So what are some of the lessons that we've learned from this? One, um, get the archivist to be a model. That really does help quite a bit. So if you look at this seersucker <laughs> article on Wikipedia, this is actually one of the photos you'll find of the archivist there. So that's lesson number one. Uh, lesson number two, you know, we are trying to find different ways of engaging folks in Wikipedia. Everyone uses Wikipedia every day, but it's this abstract thing that kind of pops up on your mobile or your computer. But we're trying to provide tangible ways for people to kind of meet human beings face to face and understand and how to work with Wikipedia uh, more effectively. So we're trying to go backwards in time a little bit to say, you know, face to face interaction is really important. Just having these interactions online are usually not enough to get more people involved with Wikipedia. There are many different projects underneath the Wikimedia umbrella. You're probably familiar with Wikipedia. If you've seen images or video or audio, you've actually used what we call Wikimedia Commons, which has uh, all the multimedia content for the Wikipedia project. But then there's also other, uh, uh, there's also another project called Wikidata, which I'll talk to you in about a second, which really does amazing things with structuring the data that we have in Wikipedia right now. So when I was asked to talk about what are the open, collaborative, and participatory elements um, that I could give some insight on, well, first, I want to talk about participation. And something that most people may not know about Wikipedia is that it really isn't a technological breakthrough. It's actually more of a social breakthrough. And if you look at what has allowed Wikipedia to become so uh, large and dominant, it's not that it is a technically uh, excellent system. It actually, if you look at it now, it looks a little bit retrograde. It actually looks like a site from 10 or 12 years ago. But it is highly functional and there's a lot of things underneath the surface that allow for the community to come together to interact, to dialogue, to um, collaborate on things. Right? So if you look at some of the books that were published you know, over 10 years ago, they put Wikipedia in the same area as blogs and Second Life. When was the last time you used Second Life or even talked about it? Right? And then blogging has really tailed off its activity, and Facebook and Twitter have risen. But Wikipedia is still there in this, in this uh, space of being very active and very relevant to what we use today. So the secret sauce was not the technology. It was the social aspect. And we sometimes call this in the Wikipedia universe the piranha effect. Right? Lots of people doing small changes to create big change within the system. The other thing I thought we, I, sh I should tell you about is coding literacy is really important going forward. Wikipedia has always de depended on the ability for people to edit pages and to save pages, but we're now we're seeing that a lot of the power in using Wikipedia comes from knowing how to use the APIs on the back end, how to do interesting things um, in terms of adding content to Wikipedia. Something you may not know of is that the original content in Wikipedia when it was started in 2001, a lot of that first came from government produced data. In fact, the CIA fact book, I don't know how many people have used that recently, was one of the few things on the net in October 2004 that was you know, well built out, had maps, had lots of uh, content there that you could look up as factual information. So in fact, Wikipedia borrowed a lot from the CIA fact book, I'm sorry, not 2004, 1994, when it first com came online. So a lot of the things that you see in Wikipedia now actually use uh, 
programs to suck in data and to create content on Wikipedia, including US Census data and a lot of other online databases. In terms of collaboration, there's some really interesting things happening now in video co-creation and editing. So how many people here have shot video on their mobile phone before? Probably all of you, right? How many people have ever edited that video? A handful, maybe 20, 10 to 20%, right? So we all know that video is something you might shoot, you might share. Um, if anyone has ever used Vine, it's a six second video chunk that you could send to someone. And the reason why everyone's emphasizing short video is because no one ever bothers to edit long video. It's a very hard thing to do. It's not something most people know how to, how to actually get their hands on. So the act of doing video content is a very complex process. And if you look in Wikipedia right now, of the five million articles in Wikipedia, barely 0.1 or 0.2% of articles have video of any kind. Right. So when's the last time you saw a video associated with a Wikipedia article? You probably have never seen a video, right? There is the technical means to have it there, but we really don't have a community based around video. And we know that the newer generation of folks using mobiles, using Snapchat, uh, and watching YouTube all the time and not broadcast television are in fact a video generation. And we're trying to harness that video generation for a next generation of content within Wikipedia. And a lot of these things um, are gonna be relevant for government agencies going forward. How do you incorporate video creation and video collaboration in your um, outreach to the community? So right now, the Wikipedia community is working with two partners, Internet Archive out in San Francisco and the Mozilla Foundation, which has funded things like Firefox and other types of free software projects to create a collaborative video editing system in a web browser. So you don't even need to download software. You don't need to buy expensive video editing uh, software. You can simply upload your clips, try to edit a video together, and someone else can come along with what we call the piranha effect and make your video better, and you can actually create subtitles together, and make better and better edits as you go forward. This has been a very elusive thing um, in the commercial video editing realm, and it's probably something that can only be solved through open source software. And that's something that we're working on right now in terms of increasing the ability for crowds to do video together. Right, so we have a new generation of visual learners where this is normal for them, and I barely use Snapchat, and I consider myself pretty advanced, so we've got a whole new set of folks using technologies that are um, you know, much more advanced than we're used to in terms of mobile, uh, mobile apps. Then finally, I want to talk about open linked data. This is probably something interesting to a lot of you folks there. How many people here have ever heard of Wikidata before? Ah, not that many, good. So Wikidata is uh, one of the main thrusts of the Wikipedia movement going forward. And if you look at what Wikidata does, it basically tries to take the content of Wikipedia pages, and instead of those numbers, stats, dates, occupations, locations, all just sitting as text information on a page, you're actually trying to put them in as databases, database entries for that topic, right? So for example, if you look at something like this, which is the entry on Wikipedia for this novel by Jhumpa Lahiri, you see that there's some information on the right in terms of the language, the author, the publish date, but then a lot of the other stuff is just kind of sprinkled throughout the prose. If you want to go through Wikipedia and say, return all the authors that wrote a book in 2013, that would be very hard right now. Right? You'd have to look at categories, you might have to parse certain pages. But what we're starting to see is that Wikidata, which started a number of years ago to try to structure all this data, now breaks that page into assertions like this. Right, the year, the author, all these things. And because it's in a database format, you can suddenly do a lot of cool things like query this Wikidata database and have an answer within seconds against millions and millions of entries. And that was really never possible with Wikipedia, but with Wikidata, um, with volunteers moving that content from Wikipedia pros into database entries like this, you've got some really interesting things that can be done. So for example, this is a great, uh, project here, which is called Mix and Match, and this was created by some Wikipedia editors, and it basically is trying to uh, link all the other open databases on the net into Wikidata. Right. So think about this for a second. You've got about 100 different databases here. Some are art databases. Some are very well known, like the, the Getty databases there. And you're basically trying to say, you know, if you've got Pablo Picasso here, or you've got Antonin Scalia, you want to link to as many databases on the net that have information about them. And then suddenly Wikidata is the central hub for all the different databases on the net. So in fact, Wikidata has become so popular and so successful, Google killed their own project 
in deference to Wikidata, saying that Wikidata is doing it faster, better than we could ever do, and Google said, we have this project called Freebase, we're no longer doing that because Wikidata is better, which is pretty impressive. So for example, if you look here at the entry for Anton Scalia, a lot of information about Scalia here. If you look at his Wikidata entry, you'll see all these links out to other databases, the identifiers and all these other databases. And this is some really great uh, uh, results because you can suddenly now not just depend on one database for all this information, Wikidata now points to all the other databases out there. So at a recent event that we had at the Smithsonian, we found a real practical use for this. We're editing entries for um, Black History Month, and you'd be surprised how many databases for uh, museums actually don't have the ethnicity of artists, right? So you actually have this really wonderful listing of artists and what, art, uh, what uh, artistic pieces they created, where they're born, but you don't have the ethnicity. But you have some other databases that have the ethnicity, so you actually don't need all this information in one database. You can just have a network of databases that give you these answers, and Wikidata is the central hub to point to all these different databases out there. Then some other cool things you can do, once you have this in a database format, you can have projects like this one, like Histropedia. So if you go to Histropedia, you can actually go in there and make interactive timelines simply by typing in, you know, uh, British monarchy 1800s, and boom, you get all this information slapped on the uh, timeline there, and you can drag and drop these entries around simply because they're in a database format. So it's pretty neat. So finally, I just wanted to close with this one really interesting fact that this one year, <laughs> This, this past year was when we realized freshmen or first year students going into college have never known a world without Wikipedia. So I don't know if that's a net positive or it's something that they don't appreciate the fact that we have to work really hard to figure out some of the stuff before. In general, I'm envious of them. I think it's a great thing to have at their fingertips, but it's gonna be really interesting to see what this next generation of folks does with the Wikipedia model going forward and how this also means that they're set up to interact with data that the government puts out in, in really interesting ways. So thank you for your time, and hope you enjoyed that. Thank you, Professor Lee. Our next speaker will be the academic dean and Ford Foundation professor in de democracy and citizenship at the Harvard uh, Kennedy School, Arkan Fung. Professor Fung co-directs the Transparency Policy Project and leads democratic <coughs> governance programs of the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation at the Kennedy School. His books include Full Disclosure, The Perils and Promise of Transparency with Mary Graham and David Weil and Empowered uh, Participation, Reinventing Urban Democracy. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd just like to thank the uh, director and the staff of the National Archives uh, for hosting this event and inviting me. It's been a great discussion already so far, and I'm delighted to be part of it. Um, I want to take uh, my few minutes here to really press the people in this room to think hard about a question that was on the very first panel. Why are you in the transparency and information business in the first place? right? And then kind of provocatively, what's next? What does it require? And uh, I'm going to ask you to stretch here and at least for the next 10 or 15 minutes, uh, take a little bit of an adventure on that. Now, it has been really, really thrilling to hear the first panel and the second people, panel, people working outside of government, inside of government, making so much progress, being so passionate about information and transparency. And in the last couple of decades, three decades, four decades, we've seen amazing progress on transparency. And I want to give you just a, a two-stage history of that. The first stage is about freedom of information and what I call information on demand. And in 1980, there were about five countries that had FOIA acts in the world. And by 2004, and certainly by now, there are more than 60 countries that have freedom of information acts on their books that give citizens of those countries a presumptive right to the information that government has. And this is a huge gain for uh, democratic societies that have freedom of information. That's the first stage. The second stage has largely been enabled by 
all sorts of digital technologies. And the second stage I call the stage of naked government, where it's not just information on demand, but just the presumption that, uh, as the discussion of the Data Act uh, kind of brought up, that whatever government, information government has, it will be out there for you on the web or in other forms, so you can just get it if you want. You don't even have to make FOIA requests. That could be the second stage. And those are great, great developments for transparency, I think. But it's not enough. And I want to, I hope that the next stage of transparency will be far more ambitious even than those two. And I want to call this third stage, and I hope it's coming, I want to call it democratic transparency. And the idea of democratic transparency is underlying these first two stages of transparency and what we celebrate here during Sunshine Week. It's the idea that people should have the information that they need to make decisions to help them participate effectively in democracy and to protect the interests that they have, their really important interests. And so Lauren Ellen, I think, put it um, really clearly in the first panel that what information transparency is about is enabling citizens to make their democracy together. And I really, really like that idea. And it's about people being able to make their democracy together through making effective political decisions, but also all sorts of other decisions, like um, uh, Sabrina talked about, college decisions. That's not really a political decision, but a private decision about education, around health care, around finance, et cetera. That in a society with, uh, that is democratically transparent, what I call kind of fancifully infotopia, everybody has all of the information they need to make the really important decisions that affect their lives. Now, if we think Sunshine Week is about that proposition, it requires our efforts in transparency to be about much, much more than governmental transparency. So I want to say that five changes flow from this proposition, that people should have the information they need to make important decisions about their important interests. The first change, and the most important one for you to think about, is that transparency should not just be about government, but it should be about all of the organizations that affect people's lives, and in particular, private corporations, nonprofit organizations, as well as government. Why limit transparency to government, right? Because government does make a lot of important decisions that affect your life, but so do all of these other actors, like colleges, for instance. We want information about them. So, that's the, uh, the first important change, is that the scope of transparency should be about any organization that makes important decisions that affect our lives, right? Now, the second change is a little bit of a change of mindset, right? And the change of mindset is that when we think about transparency, we think about government as the target of transparency, of information, and we want this information to hold government accountable. And that's a very, very important thing to do. But in this kind of idea about democratic transparency, that's important, but government is also your friend because government is the only entity out there that is big enough and strong enough to compel all of these other big organizations in society to give society the information that it needs. They oftentimes won't give that information without the compulsion of laws and public policies, right? So Naked transparency, may all, putting all of these data sets out there on the web is, is really, really great. I love that. But it does maybe have one kind of downside that people might want to think about in this room, and many of you are engaged in that effort. And it may be that the age of naked transparency is contributing to our collective cynicism about the effectiveness and integrity of government in the following way. In an environment of naked government, it's like a performance rating system. It's like an Amazon rating system, you know, the Amazon five-star rating system. It's like an Amazon rating system in which government can only get three stars at most, usually just one or two. And why is that? It's because when people are uh, people who aren't uh, competitors with other companies, you know, kind of some journalists and so on, filing for FOIA requests and using all of the open data, oftentimes they're journalists. And journalists find it very hard to tell a good story, a positive story about government. They find it much easier because it fits in their scripts. I'll just assert here, and you can um, think about this later on tonight, telling negative stories about government. And so it's not, it's, uh, I want to say that, you know, the information out there, you could tell all sorts of stories about government with it, 
But FOIA is not neutral in the sense that it's more likely to generate negative stories than positive stories about government. And so its use may contribute to um, an increasing cynicism about the effectiveness of government. Um, OK, so just be careful about that. And in democratic transparency, government is your friend because you need government to help you get the information that you need. OK, now the third change that flows out of this idea of democratic transparency is proportionality. All of us in here in different ways, insofar as we're concerned about transparency, spend part of our energy trying to get information from organizations, from governments, from foundations, from private sector organizations, et cetera. My uh, third proposition here is that we should allocate that energy pretty carefully. We shouldn't just try to get the data sets that are most popular or most in demand, but we should try to get the information that will best protect people's interests, right, from the organizations that most threaten or advance people's interests. So if I were in a, uh, in a society where the state controlled most things or a lot of things, like an authoritarian China maybe, then my primary target of transparency would be the government because I would believe in that society government poses the most risks to citizens' well-being. Now in this society, I think it is true that government does create a lot of risk for people, but so do a lot of other organizations, in particular uh, people that uh, may make your spinach free of E. coli or not. The, uh, there's all sorts of food risks, there's health risks, there's finance risks. So uh, I think sober people in favor of transparency should look across that landscape and say, okay, which organizations create the most risks for the citizens in the society, and let's make those organizations more transparent because citizens will need information to hold those organizations accountable and understand what they're doing or not doing, right? So that is the third proposition about transparency. The fourth proposition is, I think everybody will sign on to, is that accessibility is really, really important. And accessibility is, is availability is how much information is out there. Accessibility is, can people use it to inform the decisions that they make, right? And technology, of course, helps enormously with this, as we saw in many ways today already, like the, the uh, college scorecard app, et cetera, right? But all sorts of accessibility is not technologically driven. So one of the best accessibility measures that I've seen is the LA restaurant report card system, where if anybody's eaten out in LA, you know that every restaurant has a letter grade posted on its front window that is A, B, or C, depending on the health and safety inspection of that restaurant, right? And that's not a very teched up solution, but it does make that piece of information that government has pried out of all of these restaurants really accessible to anybody who wants to eat there, right? And indeed, far more accessible, I think, than a lot of teched up solutions like putting the health and safety records on the web. And I, I would venture to say it's even more accessible, that old grade card poster than putting it on Yelp, which I would also favor, but I think it's, it's easier to see it right there on the front window. Okay, so that's uh, accessibility. And then the fifth proposition, which is a, gonna be a little bit of a stretch also, is that we're all accustomed, and you saw it a lot in the discussion so far, of thinking about the main users of information as individuals, individual citizens, individual consumers, et cetera, right? That's why we do the user-centered design. That's why we begin you know, from what the users want and build up the apps and the data sets from there. And it is indeed very, very important to make information accessible to individuals as users of information. But in this domain of sunshine and freedom of information and public accountability and private accountability, a huge number of the users of important information in a democratic society will not be individuals per se, Joe Citizen, you know, kind of busting out his uh, spreadsheet and Stata program and downloading the recovery.gov data sets to figure out if anybody's, you know, built the government. No, it will be professionals like journalists and organizations who are, whose purpose it is to hold these different large organizations accountable. So when you're designing, when you're deciding what data sets to make available to the public, deciding what APIs to create, have in mind not just the individual as a user, but organizations as a user. And let me just close with a couple of stories, or just one story here. Um, 
One of the most important public transparency regulations of the last few decades has been the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act from the 1980s. And what that act does is require banks, uh, especially in urban areas, to disclose the characteristics of uh, the people who they're loaning to and not loaning to and the mortgages they give, right? And this was very, very important in the early days because before the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, not very many people believed that redlining even existed. But after the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, everybody believed that redlining existed because they had the data to demonstrate what banks were actually doing and who they were lending to and who they weren't. But the main users of that information were not individual people in the inner city who wanted to apply for a home loan. No, it was uh, organizations, uh, community organizations in inner cities like in cities like Chicago and other places who had the analytic capability to use that information to figure out which banks were good uh, kind of uh, make, making fair lending decisions and which ones were not doing so well on the fair lending criteria to uh, process that data, to make arguments to the government and to individual banks that they should do better, and therefore, thereby, uh, making huge changes in how lending was done in the financial sector, right? And so that's a story, and there are many, many others about how the important actors, if what you want to do is uh, create real meaningful change and allow people to participate meaningfully in a democratic society, are sometimes not just individual users of information, but organizational users, right? And so underlying all of these comments is the idea that uh, what I'm trying to do here is explain to you kind of in the first panel, uh, one of the questions was, well, what's next? And some of the panelists had a little bit of time, a struggle kind of answering that question because I think they had a little bit of a difficulty identifying why they were in this business in the first place. And so what I'm trying to do here is to offer you an answer for why you're in this business in the first place. And my answer is that you want to create a public good for all of society for your fellow citizens and give them the information that they need to protect themselves and to advance their critical interests in the face of a government that doesn't always behave well and private organizations that don't always behave well, right? I think that that is why everybody is showing up here to celebrate Sunshine Week. And then I want to say, well, if you're really committed to that proposition, which I believe you are and I know I am, then you have to take it to this logical conclusion which is that FOIA is great and open government is great, but it needs to go much further so that we really have all of the information that we need to protect our vital interests and, uh, and act effectively in this democratic society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Fong. Um, our last speaker could not join us in person today, but she recorded a message for us. Megan Smith is the Chief Technology Officer of the United States. In this role, she serves as an assistant to the President. As USCTO, Ms. Smith focuses on how technology, technology, policy, data, and innovation can advance the future of our nation. Hi. Smith, I'm the Chief Technology Officer for the U.S., and I want to say Happy Sunshine Week, uh, which is right now because of President Madison's birthday. Um, it's also awesome that you guys are at the National Archives. I love that one of their missions is Make Access Happen, an entire federal agency that's dedicated to preserving our records and making them open to the public so we can all know uh, all of that incredible information and use it uh, both to know our history and also to derive our future. So the president has a really high priority on open government, on open data. Uh, since he came into office, he has opened uh, over 200,000 data sets. So we're seeing amazing work from what's been going on forever with the incredible NOAA team and our weather community with open data, but now into uh, last week, the launch of the Open Opportunity Project with more of the HUD, Department of Labor. Uh, there is opportunity.census.gov is the place to find those new tools and the folks who are starting to build apps on top of that. It's really exciting to see what we can do when we collaborate. The other thing that the president has really prioritized is getting everyone involved, and that includes our tech communities that have uh, been building these incredible products in the private sector uh, that we see, whether it's Facebook or Amazon or Twitter and all those amazing products that are there. 
how do we bring that kind of uh, technology to our service delivery from government? So we've been not only working with the amazing federal CIOs um, that are in each of the agencies and the CIO council, the chief technology officers, um, our emerging data scientists who are, are coming to government and have, are lifting a government, but also new teams like the 18F at uh, GSA and the US Digital Service, which is now in several agencies. Also the Presidential Innovation Fellows, uh, which are like kind of entrepreneurs and residents. So having those technical folks together with their other colleagues working to make sure we're using those state-of-the-art uh, tools and technologies in the service delivery from the government. And I really encourage all of you to think about that as you're doing your work. Who are some tech teammates uh, that you can bring into your products as you think about usability of what you're launching, as you think about uh, APIs and ways to get other people involved and the quality of those products that they can really be state-of-the-art. Uh, the president also has a high priority uh, on how we are engaging in the world and launched the Open Government Partnership, uh, which includes at first several countries and now over 70 countries met um, in Mexico City So uh, last fall. So we're seeing great energy from uh, other countries with their open government work and their national action plans like ours. Many of you in the room I know have been part of the US national action plan and I thank you for the work in uh, version one, version two, and now our third national action plan that we're busy uh, working on as well as completing commitments from the earlier ones. So thank you for your work. Uh, let's get cross-functional, get everybody involved, get the techies too, and happy Sunshine Week. Thank you for your attention. Um, we've heard a lot today about the future of open government and how technology can make it possible. As we think about the future, it's also important to recognize the foundations of our belief in open government. We will now have a five minute break before the archivist of the United States rejoins the, the stage to introduce our keynote speaker, Senator Patrick Leahy of Vermont, who has been a champion of open government and particularly FOIA for more than four decades. Uh, please make sure you're, you're in your seats at promptly at 3.30. Thanks.
So it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce keynote speaker, Senator Patrick Leahy. Senator Leahy, who ranks first in seniority in the Senate, was elected to the Senate in 1974 to represent his home state of Vermont. He is the ranking member of the Senate Judiciary Committee and the senior most member of both the Appropriations Committee and of the Agriculture Committee. Senator Leahy is also the ranking member of the Appropriations Subcommittee on State Department Foreign Operations and Related Programs. He is the Senate's leading champion of open government and of the Freedom of Information Act, and he was instrumental in the creation of the Office of Government Information Services. In 1996, Senator Leahy was installed in the FOIA Hall of Fame in recognition of his efforts. We are so grateful for his guidance and leadership in this area, and we look forward to hearing his thoughts on FOIA's past, present, and future. One last data point about the senator you should have. He has appeared in not one, not two, but three Batman movies. <laughs> Please welcome Senator Patrick Lee. It, I, before I um, <laughs> thank you for that, before I get into the serious things, I I want you to know when it, it, the the Batman, uh, I started reading when I was four years old, and spent a lot of time at the Children's Library in Montpelier, Vermont, and among other things, read Batman comic books and. Somehow that worked into writing art, writing stories for Batman, including an anti-landmine one, and then being in uh, actually four so far, and next week we'll be in a fifth one. <laughs> the beauty of that is every cent of that, and it's a lot, uh, goes to the children's library. They're they're uh, safe on books books for the next 20 or 25 years, I think, <laughs> mainly be by having. Various villains try to kill me, but <laughs> never successfully. And even when they come close, uh, our press secretary, when asked about it, explains my wife, the registered nurse, and a superb one, put me back together. I never, mi I never missed a vote. <laughs> On a more serious thing, though, it, it is important what you do here. I, I wish I'm always telling people, come on down here to the archives. It's this is a sense of, of history. My mother and father were alive. They used to come here so often, and so many of our friends over over the years uh, would come here. I remember my late brother coming in here with me and <clears throat> not wanting to leave and looking at the things. You, you're not on the front page of the paper every day, which is probably good in some ways, <laughs> but your work is so essential. Any government that claims to be a democracy must make a record of its work for the public. It's important not just for posterity, but to ensure the American people can hold their government accountable so they can know what's happening at the moment, not an historian, just an historian 50 years later. So that's what um, National Archives and Records Administration now it does. I, I'm in awe coming in here. I remember coming in here as a teenager. Uh, when I was in college, again coming in here when I was a law student at Georgetown, just walking, walking through here. Where else can you go? Your constitution is on display for people to see every day. And I, I don't know how many times I've come with people and they say, but it, is that an exact copy? I, no, it's not an exact copy. <laughs> and then you explain why it's not an exact copy. It's the original. And it's almost like, you know, should I uh, take my shoes off? Should I stay in? <laughs> and so on. But we're guided by the Constitutional's principle that we have to work to create a more perfect union by ensuring the government is open to the people we serve. Every year during Sunshine Week, we recommit ourselves to this fundamental principle. It goes hand in hand with the public's right to know. It, uh, our democracy 
is built upon the premise that our government does not operate in secret, even though some in government have thought otherwise. After all, a government by and for the people can't be one hidden from the people. An open government is a powerful antidote against corruption and secrecy and other forces that from time to time threaten to make leaders unaccountable to their citizens. You know, we had the other day in, um, in our Senate caucus, we were talking about Supreme Court nominations. And they were talking about Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis. Remember, he was the one who said sunlight is the best disinfectant. It's always been that way. It is always that way in a true democracy. One of the most powerful tools that brings sunshine to government in the halls of power is the Freedom of Information Act. It's a copy out here. Uh, this year, on July 4th, FOIA turns 50. Now look at the signatures of the people who signed it. Lyndon Johnson, the uh, Vice President, Hubert Humphrey, the Speaker of the House, John McCormick. They're all gone, but the principles are still there. Five decades, we've allowed Americans to access and therefore have influence in the workings of government. And I've worked with both Republicans and Democrats to strengthen it. Things have changed. We've gone to the digital age and all that, and we try to bring it up to date. The FOIA Improvement Act, which I've been working on for years, will take that 50-year-old FOIA and bring it into the 21st century. It will codify what President Obama laid out in his historic 2009 memorandum. It requires federal agencies to to adopt, and think of this, a presumption of openness when considering the release of government information under FOIA. Not a presumption of we'll cover up our mistakes or things that we find embarrassment, but a presumption of openness. That policy was first put in place by President Clinton. It was then repealed by his successor, President George W. Bush. President Obama reinstated as one of his first acts in office. But we can't leave it to whoever the next president will be and say, well, this is inconvenient. We'll change it. We have to hold all presidents and their administrations accountable to the highest standards. If we codify the presumption of openness, we declare that sunshine, not secrecy, is the default setting of our government. And I've gone to both Republicans and Democrats and say, the presidency and the administration goes back and forth. Sometimes it's Democratic control, sometimes it's Republican. But shouldn't it be open no matter what? Because every administration is going to be proud to tout what they think they've accomplished and done right. They're going to be less eager to tout what they think they may have done wrong. It should be open on everything. And when my bill becomes law, and it will very soon, federal agencies be required to make frequently requested documents available online. They'll put government information in a format most successful to the American people. I can pick up this and call up one of the, one of the documents. And they have an online portal that allows FOIA requests to be submitted to any federal agency through one website. They'll update FOIA for the digital age. They'll make our government more transparent and more accountable to we the people. Now, the Senate passed my FOIA Improvement Act in 2014 unanimously. Every Democrat, every Republican joined together. I was deeply disappointed that the House leadership would not bring it up. So the time to do it is right now. Our efforts have always been bipartisan. That should continue. And so I'm calling on both the Democratic and Republican leadership to have differences on some things, come together on this one. Show the American people that we care, not about ourselves, but about their right to know. And then we can't stop there. We have to make sure our government conducts its work in public, 
uses technology to invite more people into public proceedings. You know, this access and priority and transparency was a priority for me when I was chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee during the consideration of the last two Supreme Court nominees. I said it will be live and it will be streamed and it will be available to everybody in the United States and around the world from the time the gavel comes down opening the hearing to the time the gavel goes down to end the hearing. Public confirmation hearings for Supreme Court nominees are an important moment. This is one time when the three federal branches of government come together. And the American public can look and say, okay, how, how are you folks doing? The Senate Judiciary Committee first began holding public hearings to consider Supreme Court nominees in 1916, at least a couple of years before I joined the Senate. <laughs> and then, since then, we've tried every way to make it more accessible to the American public. In 1981, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, the woman recommended by, at that time, the most conservative member of the Senate, Barry Goldwater, nominated by Ronald Reagan, she made history. She broke the glass ceiling. She became the first woman nominated to the Supreme Court. But she was also the first Supreme Court nominee where the American public had a televised hearing. And it was an eye-opener, the calls and the mail I got from my small state. And it was nothing compared to what the larger states. Now, of course, we have webcast, social media, and other platforms. So the American public fully expects to be able to view this confirmation process after all, it affects their constitutional rights and their lives, and they know when the cameras are rolling, there is at least that transparency. And they understand that there's transparency, you have accountability. Now, three weeks ago, Judiciary Committee Republicans decided to end this transparent process and to end 100 years, 100 years of bipartisan tradition. It came from a session that was closed to the press and to the public, and closed to all Democrats in the Senate, and they unilaterally announced that our committee would not hold a public hearing or vote on any Supreme Court nominee this year. Now, in a letter to the Senate Majority Leader, the Republicans claimed their closed door and unprecedented decision was somehow an effort to protect the will of the American people. We'll close the door on the American people. We won't let the American people have a voice in what you're saying. We won't let the American people know what we're doing, but somehow we're protecting the will of the American people. This is one of the most condescending and erroneous thing I've heard in 40 years in the Senate from either party. They want to protect the will of the people. Why are they so afraid to take their actions in front of the American people? And they're posing a public hearing and a vote. They're on the wrong side of history. During my years in the Senate, every pending Supreme Court nominee has received a public hearing and an open and public vote. Now, without a public hearing, Americans can't watch their senators and their president nominee engage in discussions about our Constitution. Without a vote, American citizens are unable to hold the senators accountable. What it does is allow some senators not to have to be accountable and vote yes or no, but they can vote maybe. I didn't get elected to a six-year term to vote maybe. I, I have cast 15,000 votes. <laughs> yeah. I may have cast some dumb votes somewhere along the line, but at least I'm accountable for it. And this idea that, well, this is controversial, a number of us are up for re-election this year, well, so am I. Don't vote maybe. Don't vote maybe. Vote yes. Every single one of these senators took an oath and said, so help me God to uphold the Constitution. Well, 
president's going to uphold his constitutional duty, which requires him to make a nomination. He told me again this weekend he's going to do it soon. Then, the Senate leadership, Republican leadership, has to choose sunshine over secrecy in the Supreme Court confirmation process. And in case this sounds partisan, I've taken the same position, whether it's been Democrats or Republicans, that wanted to close doors on these things. But I have never, ever thought in my years here, my years as a law student here in Washington, that anybody, anybody would stand up with a straight face and say, no, we don't want to do our constitutional duty. Come back next year, we'll see how things go, and then we might. Uh, the irony is, I think I knew Justice Scalia well enough, and while I disagreed with him on a lot of things, he wouldn't want us to hold up. And the Republican nominated, Sandra Day O'Connor, has stated very publicly, we should go for it. So I, ho I hope that things are going to be better. Today's conference focused on one of our most powerful tools for promoting transparency and accountability, that's technology. Everybody now is in a new world. When I have a then five-year-old grandson want to see something on the computer, which I pulled up for him, when he takes the mouse out of my hand and says, I'll take over because it gets very complicated. <laughs> uh, I, I know it's a new world. Um, but my parents ran an independent printing press in Vermont. They had a weekly newspaper. I understood how technology could change the public. Back then, it's what you printed and shown. Now it's going to be what you have online. All that separates our citizens from vital information and news off in the click of a button. So as policymakers in the federal government, it's our job to ensure the technological process comes in real, palpable access to the workings of our government. So let's reaffirm that in Sunshine Week. As we approach FOIA's 50th birthday, just think of that. I mean, we, we assume this is almost part of our Constitution. Well, it should be. Let's strengthen the historic law. Let's pass the FOIA Improvement Act. Because 50 years from now, when FOIA has its centennial anniversary, Whatever generation is sitting here, look back at this moment. They will gauge our commitment. They will ask, were we really believing in creating a government that's genuinely open to all people, no matter what their politics are, no matter who they are? We're genuinely open. Well, let's, let's let them see that we at least chose to let the sun shine in. Thank you all very much. So thank you so much for joining us today, Senator Leahy. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Amy Bennett with the Office of Government Information Services. Uh, I want to, on behalf of Director Holzer and the Archivist, I want to thank Senator Leahy uh, for his continued support for the Freedom of Information Act and for the Ombudsman's Office and for uh, his continued commitment to open government. It's my great honor to introduce our last speaker for today, uh, who is Dick Huff. Uh, as Senator Leahy has, and as a lot of people have said, FOIA is 50. Uh, we know that it is amended about every 10 years, but FOIA also continues to change 
every day, just about every month, sometimes every week, due to court cases. Uh, so Mr. Huff is going to be telling us about some recent changes to FOIA through litigation. Uh, Mr. Huff served as one of two co-directors of the Office of Information and Privacy from the time of the office's creation in 1982 until his retirement in 2005. In addition to serving as the, official, as, the, uh, as the official designated by the Attorney General to act on all administrative FOIA appeals by the Department of Justice components, he litigated and supervised FOIA cases as the district and appellate level, at the district and appellate level, and has testified before Congress at the subcommittee and committee levels on the implementation of the 1996 electronic FOIA amendments and on the interface between FOIA and the Privacy Act. Thank you, Amy. Um, when uh, Amy asked me to come here and, and showed me the lineup of folks who's, you've got here, I said, oh my golly, look at that. This is, this is a, 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 like a baseball game. These are, these are a, a bunch of heavy hitters that are going before me in the, in the different panels. And then Senator Leahy is going to hit cleanup. And uh, I don't know about me. And Amy says, you'll be the closer to come in for the win. And I says, I'm not sure. I may be the guy with a 6.8 ERA that comes in and who just mops up when we're trailing seven to nothing. I can see it's gotten a lot thinner here. I can imagine if the Nats were trailing by seven runs, it would have gotten a lot thinner there. Thank you, Amy. Uh, all right. Uh, so what are we going to talk about today? I've got about seven cases that I wanted to, to chat about. And if anybody, instead of taking questions at the end, if you've got questions as we're going along, stand up and wave your hand, and I may be able to see you. If you just put your hand up like this, I certainly won't be able to see you. But uh, I'll do the best I can to respond to those as, I've, uh, as I'm going along. I've got about seven cases here. And after uh, uh, sitting through the first half of uh, today's program, I looked at this and I said, oh my golly, what, what cases did you select, Dick? Six out of the seven are withholding cases where the government's practice of withholding was affirmed. Only one was one where we've got uh, uh, an order of disclosure. But let's just take a look at these anyway. We'll see what we, uh, what we do have here. Uh, I've got two procedural cases, the first of which is uh, competitive enterprise versus EPA. And that's really a two-part case. We've got a FOIA and, because we're here at the, the archives, it fits out well, a uh, federal records issue uh, that goes along with it. And the uh, Competitive Enterprise Institute asked EPA for uh, uh, a number somewhere in the neighborhood of 5,000 uh, uh, text messages that had gone back and forth between two senior uh, uh, EPA players. And EPA came back and said, we have no records. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, competitive enterprise, it, it, I guess on the appeal or whatever, said, hey, I'm sure you've got uh, records. I've seen both of these people texting back and forth. One of them was in a congressional hearing, and she was texting at that point. I'm sure she's got, you know, uh, uh, records. And they said, well, all of those records were deleted at the time right after they were sent or right after they were received. We don't save text messages. So that led to the second part of the, the um, uh, complaint, and that was, or, or the, the, the lawsuit, and that was, well, give me the piece of paper. Court, first of all, EPA, have you advised the archivist of the fact that you are not saving federal records? Because the Federal Records Act says you got to save federal records of a certain category and such. If they are important. And these were, some of these were probably important. They were from senior players, so they probably should have saved at least some of them. And, and they said, uh, uh, and if you're not doing that, uh, if you have improperly destroyed some, you're supposed to report yourself, self-report to the archivist. So I'd like to see that paper. Well, we don't have that one either. So they sued first for the records and second uh, under the Administrative Procedure Act for the second cause of action saying, judge, make them, uh, order them, to write a letter to the archivist. Well, EPA won, and it's no surprise that they won the FOIA case. If we don't have any records, we can't be required to create records. 
There was no way of recreating these text messages that had been destroyed. And, and even if they had been improperly destroyed, under the FOIA, we are not required to, to disclose them. And that's exactly what the court uh, uh, held here. But the real point of this case is the court said these are agency records for purposes of should have been saved or at least for, for archives purposes, federal records purposes. Some of these must have been federal records. You should have been saving these. So the teaching point on this case is if your agency, and I'm sure none of you are at agencies that do this, that don't save your text messages in such a manner so that they are uh, uh, susceptible to proper archiving and determination as to whether they should be saved for uh, historical purposes for a while, uh, you certainly should be if you want to pay attention to what this case has, has held. All right, let's take a look then at the, at the next case. Oh, my golly. Let's try this one here. And that is uh, IUTA versus Federal Trade Commission. And what we had here is a concept of unreasonably burdensome. Well, Dick, unreasonably burdensome is something that comes up all the time. If we have a FOIA request and uh, uh, it's going to require an unreasonably burdensome search, then we don't have to perform that search. And that comes from the statutory language that says uh, all of uh, the federal agency uh, uh, FOIA requests have to reasonably describe records. And the courts say, how do we know if something's been reasonably described? Well, we know if it's been reasonably described if, if uh, 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 a professional uh, record custodian is able to find all of the records within the scope of the request with no more than a reasonable amount of effort, no more than a reasonable amount of time. And we've got several cases where the search would take forever and courts have said, well, that's not uh, uh, reasonably, uh, uh, that is unreasonably burdensome. It doesn't reasonably describe the case. The reason I've got IUTA up here is this is the first time I have seen a case of this nature. FTC walks in, and you see all of the, the servers there, they say, you know what, you have asked for, IUTA has asked for um, uh, the entire, by the way, I am reading right now from my own little cheat sheet, it's a page and a half, Amy has promised that it's going to be up uh, prominently displayed on the uh, uh, front page of the uh, archives uh, 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 web page, or at least buried somewhere uh, uh, if you if you search for it, but you'll be able to find significant new decisions. What I've got there is, besides the site of the case for you again, I've got about uh, four to five, six lines worth of, of discussion of it. And in IUTA, what happened is the requester uh, asked for the entire universe. He asked for uh, uh, 20 million complaints that had been filed that were electronically compiled at the Federal Trade Commission. That's very unusual. They're used to seeing uh, 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 complaints all of the time, or requests all the time for, give me all the ones about this A company or B company, you know, and they might have 50 or maybe 1,000 uh, uh, complaints there, maybe even an industry or something. Well, the way they keep them is, is when you have an electronic, when you file your electronic complaint with the Federal Trade Commission, they put it in, in uh, uh, to about six or eight different fields. And they say, here's the name of the company, and here's what went wrong, and here's the consequence of that, and then maybe some follow-up on the FTC's action over there. And then up at the front, oh, oh yes, and, and by the way, identify yourself. Who are you, and how can we get a, a hold of you? All right, so you're going to give your address of some sort there. What they routinely do they say, they say, by the way, if you're filling out this electronically, do not put any identifying information about yourself other than in those last two fields. Don't put it in, you know, describing what went wrong or, or what the injury was or anything like that. Don't put it uh, in those places. And sure enough, if somebody then makes a request, they routinely withhold all of the, um, the uh, fields that identify individuals. Well... What happens is they have discovered that 
uh, uh, their complainants, just like everybody else, don't follow the rules all the time. So what, what happens is about one out of 20, if I recall the language of the text, uh, FTC says, about one out of 20 comes in and says, you know what, when we are reading across there, we're going to see right in what went wrong the name Richard L. Huff, you know, and then I stuck my hand into the lawnmower and my fingers got all bloody, stuff like that. So we have discovered what we have to, and I actually did that once too, you know, I, I just lost a little piece of it right here. But then I was quick because it was bleeding, so I put it the cleanest place you possibly can in your mouth. And my wife just went crazy with that. She said, excuse me. In any event, I digress. What happens is you, you then, FTC has said, we cannot just cross off these two columns. What we have to do is we've got to skim over, read, put human eyes on the other materials in there in order to get that, save that one poor, that one poor person, that one out of 20, who doesn't follow instructions and puts his own address or his own name or something like that in there. And that's what we have to do uh, 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 when we're doing something like that. So they said, you know what we have here? You have asked for all complaints. We have 20 million complaints that fall within the scope of your request. We estimate that it will take us 80,000 hours, excuse me, let's try that again, 8,000 hours of manual review. I'm surprised they could do it that fast. That seems terribly fast to me, but that was what FTC said. And they argued that is a, an unreasonably burdensome request. So it's the processing that would take an unreasonably burdensome amount of time. That's the first case I have ever seen that has said that where it is just the processing. We have had lots of cases at the FBI and of other agencies where it have taken us two or three, four years to process, five years to process all of the records. And we were able in that, those cases, just like here, to locate it. It wasn't a search issue. We could find it right away. These were, were very quickly found as well. So that's the issue that we've got here. And I think that that is uh, certainly uh, uh, something we still have to protect people against themselves. All right, let's look at the next one, and that's uh, Exemption 5. This touches a, a, a little bit uh, in the area of something that uh, Senator Leahy was chatting about. And this is uh, National Security Archive. Not National Archive, but National Security Archive, the private institution, that uh, private entity that's uh, located over at George Washington and uh, university, and they were suing the CIA, and they sought uh, uh, volume five of the history of the Bay of Pigs. Well, they, had, uh, they and others had sought uh, the prior histories, and his, uh, uh, volumes one through four had been disclosed. I believe those were all still in draft form, and this was in draft form as well. What does draft form mean? Well. The history had been written up quite a while ago, and this one had been written up in the 70s. It was the last of the group had been up, uh, written in the early 70s. And what had, what had happened with this is nobody at the CIA in an official capacity had ever said, this is the official history, we're gonna accept it, we're gonna, we're gonna bless it, we're gonna put a, a final stamp on the top of it. It was still in a draft form. And so what, what happened here, despite the fact they had let dra uh, disclosed prior drafts uh, uh, of the prior volumes, the CIA said, we're not going to disclose draft number five. And uh, uh, went up to the district court, and, and uh, the government prevailed there, went up to the Court of Appeals, and in a two-to-one decision, the Court of Appeals says, drafts is drafts, those are protected under Exemption 5, the deliberative process privilege. And even though that draft was uh, uh, just chocked full of facts, facts are still protected in a draft document because somebody in a leadership position or somebody who's working on that document could say, not that I'm saying that fact is, I could say that fact is erroneous. I could say put more facts in, cut some of the facts down, move these facts over here. It's just not a final document, even though there's a lot of facts there. 
What we had here was a 27-year-old draft document that was still subject to the deliberative process privilege. And this is something that, that reminds us that there is no sunset provision currently under Exemption 5. Uh, uh, so it is, is still so, whether it's attorney work product uh, uh, or attorney client, there is a Supreme Court case that says specifically attorney work product lasts forever. I assume that the Supremes would say the same with regard to attorney client. But what we, uh, what we had here and, and why this, this case that's uh, uh, right now uh, a little over two years, right around two years old is still of significance is the uh, FOIA reform bill that uh, 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 Senator Leahy was talking about, the one that has, had passed both the House and the Senate in one form and the other prior to in, in, 19, in 2014. And in the last few minutes of the, the session in 2014, December, they couldn't reconcile it so that they had the same bill. Accordingly, we had no law at that point. They couldn't, couldn't pass it at that time. What happens this time already is the House has passed a FOIA reform bill. Uh, Senator Leahy's committee has passed a FOIA reform bill. The two of them are not identical. But uh, the Senate has not taken up and, and voted yet on that FOIA reform bill. Both the significance of that, get to that, the significance is both of those bills prior uh, uh, in the 2014 edition and the current editions have sunset provisions for Exemption 5. And the sunset provision, going to say, is 25 years. And it says no, no federal agency may withhold anything under Exemption 5, deliberative process, attorney work product, attorney client, if a document is over 25 years old. That would have affected this, uh, this case had it been there. And in my humble opinion, and I certainly don't know any of the internal uh, uh, thoughts on this, but I'm surprised with the uh, 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 Eric Holder, uh, uh, President Obama and Eric Holder's uh, memorandum, why this wouldn't have been appropriate for discretionary disclosure. Or, granted, there still may have been some stuff in there that they wanted to withhold under uh, uh, that was still classified or something like that. Of course, you, once you make a, a discretionary disclosure, you don't have to exercise your discretion to exercise it under every exemption. But I, I certainly suspect they could have given out an awful lot of that there. That's from somebody who's outside the government now. Maybe when I was still inside, I could have understood that better. All right, let's move on. I'm sure I could have, and I probably could have defended it, I bet. Um, <laughs> What do we have here for Exemption 7C? Cheap humor that, you know, we've got two 7C cases, and the first one is Detroit Free Press. Please excuse me, most of the cases, all of the cases except this one, are cases that could affect you, how you're going to be processing records, what kind of actions you should be taking at your agency with regard to records. This one is pure litigation. But let me tell you the, the significance and why I think that's of some note. FOIA is rather unusual because you can sue, you, a requester, can sue in any of three places. You can sue where you live, where you have, uh, let's try that again, your, your residence or principal place of business, where the records are located, or you can sue in the District of Columbia. D.C. is the the venue of universal, universal venue. You can always sue there. For many other areas uh, of the law, maybe you've got a tax beef with the federal government. Well, if you've got a problem with your tax law, maybe you can sue in your home state, depending on the type of issue you've got, or if you uh, 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 want to, depending on whether you pay or not, you can go into the D.C. And, and litigate it in the tax court in D.C. But those will, are, are really pretty narrow. Under the FOIA, we have something that permits a straw man. If we have a bad decision, bad for the government, from the government's viewpoint, where the government is, is required to disclose records or there's some procedural issue they don't like, 
in a particular circuit court of appeal. There are 12 circuits, 11 numbered plus DC circuit. Uh, and if we lose one in, in say, the Sixth Circuit, which, which covers Ohio, Kentucky, Michigan, and maybe some other state, um, those are, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's fine. Anytime uh, 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 we end up having somebody who lives in those states or where we have records in those states, we know that we're going to be governed by that Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals law. But here's what happens, as opposed to my tax law example. Under the FOIA, I want uh, records. I'm a, a, a Time Magazine in New York reporter or in Arizona. And I want the, the mugshot of, um, uh, oh my goodness, I can't remember his name. The, the fellow who was convicted of, of trying to murder Gabby Gifford, the uh, representative from Arizona, and he was convicted of murdering one of her staffers. And when you saw his picture on uh, the cover of Time magazine, his mugshot, that was a federal mugshot. There are two types of mugshots, federal and state. If I get arrested for drunk driving, or if Nick Nolte gets arrested for drunk driving, odds are spectacular we are going to be pulled over by a state or local jurisdiction. And it is going to have our mugshot is going to be maintained under the state law and they will be disclosed or not under state law. The large majority of states say yes we will give out mugshots. Uh, a majority of the states also say we will give out local state rap sheets. Under the federal government though that's something we went up with rap sheets, uh, uh, your criminal history information, that went up to the Supreme Court and even though a number of states do disclose those the Supreme Court backed the FBI and said, no, we don't have to disclose those. That would be a violation of personal privacy. All right, to get to the point. What we had is we had a practice at the Marshal Service uh, for quite a while that said, we are going to protect uh, uh, mug shots. And the reason is, is that this is usually, in not all, but in many cases, one of the worst days of, of your life. And, and they're going to have a picture here of poor old Nick that day. Amy, if it's you and you got drunk driving up Montgomery County, your lipstick's going to be smeared and your hair's <laughs> this way and your mascara's going to, you know what I'm saying? It's going to be a bad day. Most mug shots, most, not all. The cool one, the one exception, is you remember Tom DeLay got arrested, state charges, not federal. You remember that one down there? And he goes down there, and he's got his tie. He had it higher than I did, and he's got like that. And it was, it was appropriate for, uh, you know, something to put on his resume. It was a great picture <laughs> that the state took there. That is highly unusual, though. In terms of, of this, this is why the federal government doesn't, doesn't do this. And even, even if you are wearing your suit and tie, it still says Montgomery County Police Department, or in this case, United States Marshal Service, and it's got a date there. You know what that says, all right? And that's the sort of reason that the, there is, uh, 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 that is embarrassing, that is personal privacy, and that's why the government was withholding them. Get to the point, Dick. We had won two district court cases in the 80s and 90s. In the 1996, Detroit Free Press, same outfit, here, same, same requester, sought um, mugshots, different case, went up to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, in a two-to-one decision at that time, said, hey, you have to disclose those mugshots. That was the first circuit, the, the only circuit at that time, that had ruled that way. Subsequently, the Marshal Service said, oh, nuts. You know, that looks like anybody from the Sixth Circuit can get these records. Okay, what we're going to do is our policy will be if you write to us or communicate to us and you're from the Sixth Circuit, one of those four states, we will process mug shots for you. That's why the one from Time Magazine was disclosed, not because a reporter was from Arizona who sought it, but he called his friend in Detroit who then asked for it, got the mug shot, and then sent it down to, uh, uh, or send it to New York or wherever it was, and that's how it ended up on Time Magazine's cover, not because they had somebody 
from Detroit themselves. It was a straw man, uh, according to the case, that, uh, that had done that. All right, so what happens now is, is uh, um, subsequent to the, the change where we said we do that, there were two courts of appeals, 2011 and 2012, um, from other, from the 11th Circuit, which is the Southern Circuit, Southern states, uh, 10th Circuit, which is Oklahoma and a few other states around there. Those two both said, hey, government's right. You should be able to withhold those records. So now we've got a split. And we said, okay, we're changing the policy again. Now we'll withhold it every time somebody asks for it. Sure enough, Detroit Free Press asked for it again. Sued us, went up to the Sixth Circuit. And the district court judge first looked at it, says, hey, I'm bound by what my circuit court of appeals law is. I got to say disclose. Goes up to the court of appeals. They have the three judge panel like they had before, not the same judges, but they said, hey, we're bound by the, our prior circuit precedent. We can't violate that. We're going to say yes. But we're, something I had never seen before, they said, we recommend this case be heard en banc. En banc means heard by the entire, uh, 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 all judges at the court of appeals level in the the Sixth Circuit. What we've got is we've got three judges at um, uh, normally make up a panel. However many we've got in that circuit, in some they're smaller circuits, we may have eight or ten. Here they've got 15 judges in the Sixth Circuit that are not on senior status. I listened to the, the proceedings uh, uh, after the uh, argument was there. I couldn't tell which way it went because there was an awful lot of questions going both ways. So I can't give you a, a, a good suggestion as to who's going to prevail on that. But I can tell you this is uh, the issue that is now presented before that circuit. And they are going to end up probably, uh, I suspect, three to six months from now, come down with an opinion on that. It's not going to, to get rid of our problem that we have with the FOIA that you can still forum shop once you've got a good circuit out there, but it, it will point out that problem perhaps once again. All right, what, do, what else do we have with 7C? Um, glomerization, and there's a picture of the Glomar Explorer there. Those of you that work with FOIA, you know that that first came up in the classified area where we refused, the CIA refused to confirm or deny whether or not the Glomar, whether they had any records on the Glomar Explorer, the, the ship that went out into the middle of the Pacific. It was classified then, it's not anymore. Dug way down in the middle of the Pacific and pulled up a, a, a sunken Russian submarine. Um, but it, it permitted us to, per, uh, under rare circumstances to withhold the abstract fact of whether we do or don't have records. And that is, the abstract fact here is, if we were to disclose, if we were to say, yes, we have records, that in and of itself would disclose a classified fact or disclose a privacy fact. The cases that have come out, and certainly my experience at the Department of Justice, not many Exemption 1 cases, we had them under Exemption 7C or 6 all of the time. Far, far higher percentage, that's personal privacy records that, uh, and in fact, even the, the famous uh, uh, Reporters Committee, although they know the Supreme Court never used the term glomerization, was that. They said, hey, do you have any uh, FBI, do you have rap sheets on any of these three Medico brothers? And uh, the Supreme, the FBI said we refuse to confirm or deny whether we have records. And the Supreme Court said yes, even if you were to say, yes, we have records and we're withholding them, that would show these people have, have had been arrested or convicted in the past somewhere. So that was a, a, an appropriate withholding there. Let's look at it uh, uh, under PETA versus NIH. The first part is, uh, of the case is something that's not particularly noteworthy. PETA asks for records on three individual researchers at Auburn University, all of which worked with 
uh, animals in scientific research. And NIH has uh, got a, a obligation that when you are an agency, when you are a, a researcher using animals and you've got federal funds uh, uh, to take certain care of the animals and use certain standards and such. Well, the uh, PETA said, hey, have you investigated A, B, or C? A, a, give me any records on A, give me any records on B, give me any records on C with regard to whether or not you have investigated them. And merely if you have investigated them, that is going to, the government argued and the court uh, uh, agreed, that is going to be a privacy interest that, that is going to be there. And they found that the, there would be no uh, uh, public interest in disclosing that information that would uh, 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 tip the balance in favor of disclosure. The point that I think is, is unusual in this case and that I, I don't recall ever seeing before is PETA's second half of the request said, all right, do you have any records about A, B, or C at Auburn University without naming any of those people? In other words, if you do, give us the records and cross out the guy or gal, but at least let us see what records you have. And uh, the, the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit says, hey, that's close enough to an individual request. If you've asked for three, you've said, hey, do I have one, two, or three? Have any of you three ever been convicted of drunk driving? You know, and just, just tie the, the, the three of you in together. I'm not going to get invited back here, I can tell. <laughs> but in, in terms of that, that is exactly the sort of thing that the Supreme Court, that the um, Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia says, hey, three is good enough. Now you can say, Dick, what about five? What about seven? What about 12? I don't know. I don't know. But at least this goes up to three. And if you've got a group of three people, this is, is good enough uh, right there. All right. The last two that I've got here uh, uh, also are under law enforcement, and this is uh, uh, 7E. 7E protects law enforcement uh, records that uh, uh, would disclose a law enforcement technique or guideline. And, and what we've got here is public employees for environmental responsibility versus U.S. section, international boundary, water commission, U.S.-Mexico. I had never heard of that agency. I, the very first time I ever taught this case, I made that observation, and some lady says, that's my agency. I don't, okay, okay. <laughs> and, and what that agency does is they work on, uh, uh, with dams right along the uh, uh, U.S.-Mexico border and some of the dams that lead immediately into it, in, in, into the Rio Grande there. And here we've got a picture uh, uh, of a dam uh, uh, breaking apart uh, uh, and breaching. Well, that is what the concern is. And they have records at the uh, uh, Boundary Water Commission that uh, uh, show, that set out um, uh, uh, surveillance and detection of the causes of emergency dam failures as well as the process for evaluating dam failure when emergency exists. Essentially, these are the SOPs for their uh, 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 protective, associate, protective force, their, their local law enforcement, uh, the, not local, their federal law enforcement that goes around checking the dams to make sure the dams are safe. There's nothing that seems to be leaking. There's nothing that seems to be a bomb that's been planted on any of them. And how often do they go around and check? And do they check in the night and this, that, and the other? All of those are in the SOP. And that's exactly the information that the court said if this were to be disclosed. And first of all, you say, hey, is this law enforcement? And the, the, you, you, we all remember it doesn't have to be cops and robbers. Uh, uh, it can also be civil or, or administrative law enforcement. Well, here they talked uh, uh, back and they said, they, they referred to uh, uh, Justice Alito's uh, concurring opinion in a recent Supreme Court case that says proactive steps designed to prevent criminal activity or maintain security. Maintaining security there can also 
qualify as uh, 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 law enforcement. So we've got law enforcement and we have um, uh, guidelines and uh, uh, security techniques to protect the dam. All right, so what's the last one that we've got here there? And that's Exemption 7F. 7F protects uh, uh, law enforcement records where there would be a threat to life or physical safety. Well, this is the area where Gee, many Christmas uh, uh, during my early practice, all the way up through the mid-90s or so, practically every case where we uh, uh, asserted and, and the case law talked about 7F, it involved uh, a DEA special agent or a DEA informant, the identity, and that is, is where we saw these. But more recently, we have looked at this and said, you know, this, this goes a little bit farther, and, and it, it can protect other information as well. What was it at, at issue in EPIC versus uh, uh, DHA, uh, Department of Homeland Security, uh, uh, were, um, were uh, uh, the SOP, the Department of Homeland Security's SOP, setting out its, don't go to sleep on me, unified voluntary process for the orderly shutdown and restoration of wireless services during emergency, uh, during critical emergencies, such as the threat of radioactive improvised explosive devices. Specifically, what this was is if you, at DHS, if they say, Homie, oh my golly, we think there's a, a bomb threat here, and we think the people are going to set off the bomb by the use of a cell phone, all right? That is the sort of thing where they are able to shut down the network, and the way they do that is they shut down either one or two cell phones that are in the area that they believe the bomb is going to be set. The way this became public is, um, gee, many Christmas, it probably would have been about uh, uh, 2010 or so, somewhere in that area. Uh, there had been a police shooting on the uh, Bay Area Rapid Transit, and there was going to be a a demonstration and there was a threat that there was going to be a bomb that was going to blow up. And DHS then uh, uh, took over, worked with that, they worked with the, uh, the uh, local police and at the particular area where there was supposed to be a bomb blowing up, they kept the trains away from that and they shut down the cell phone towers so that there wouldn't be any way of, of setting off the bombs while they searched it, and that was two hours. I can imagine being on the train going home that night on the BART train, and they have to stop it. They're not going through the station. There's going to be a two-hour delay. So I want to call Mama and tell her I'm going to be late, and then my cell phone won't work. Well, that's one of the things that caused them to explain, yes, this is what happened. And... EPIC, uh, uh, Electronic Privacy Information Center, says, hey, we'd like to see exactly what you've got with regard to uh, uh, those procedures for closing it down and then opening them back up again. And they said, we don't want to disclose those. Those are law enforcement. And we don't want to disclose them because if they were disclosed, there would be ways of avoiding those, of getting around those. People could take uh, other kinds of actions to avoid that, and that would put at, at, at uh, risk the lives or personal safety uh, uh, of people that were, anybody who was on a train, anybody who was in an area of a bomb threat, or any of the first responders to a bomb threat. Epic argued, hey, you haven't told me, you know, the name of a uh, DEA agent. You have not even a small group. You have said, a huge number of people, no telling how many people could be in that area. That's much too large a group for that to qualify as any individual, physical safety of any individual. And, and, the, Supreme, and the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia said, no, that is, is not too broad. Anybody who is in the area where a bomb could go off or anybody who's going to be a, a responder, first responder, that is, is uh, certainly sufficient. So that is, is what we've got right there. Those are all the cases I've got. Amy promises that that is going to be uh, 
uh, this list of cases that I've talked about with these same sites, no pictures, no pictures, uh, are going to be included uh, 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 on, uh, on her website. All right, thank you so much. Have a good trip home. Right. Thank, thank you, Dick, and thanks to all you who attended in person and remote uh, viewing audience for joining us on this special celebration of Sunshine Week at the National Archives. If you'd like to learn more about the work that my staff and I do at OGIS, please pick up our annual report um, on the way out. You can also visit our website, ogis.archives.gov, or read our blog, The FOIA Ombudsman. You can also follow us on Twitter at uh, FOIA underscore ombuds. And I'd be remiss if I didn't thank my wonderful staff for all of their work today, and in particular, Amy Bennett. <laughs> thank you again for joining us, and I look forward to seeing you all in, at future Sunshine Week uh, celebrations.